met a gypsy. All right. So let's send it. Jeffrey Hurlings, welcome yeah. to Gypsy Tales, mate. I'm very, very excited. We sort of just like said it a little bit then. You don't do interviews very often. I promise we'll talk about some cool stuff. Um, but yeah, man, I, I'm stoked. I'm super stoked to have you here. I appreciate it, man. I'm glad to be on your show. So I don't know if you would remember this, but we've met. And we it was really random. And it was like a crazy trip. And then I literally never spoke to you again after that. When did we meet? I can't even remember. So when we met it? at McGrath's Ranch. It's, you you got stops. you got the. I just hear I just heard you said McGrath Ranch and then the, the in the class. But I think was it uh, this like freaking ten years ago, mate? That was like November bro, 2013 it was so, when we did a DC shoot. Yeah, yeah, it was so long ago, dude. And I remember. I'd just moved to America, so I was the one that shot all of the ground footage at McGrath for the Verb Platinum, because remember Wes and the boys had yeah. were doing all the drone stuff, so I was the one that shot all the stuff on the ground, so I'd like never oh, really? met you, and I, I remember you rocked up, and it was just like a fucking hurricane rolled through town, eh? And uh, <laughs> do you remember how crazy that night, I won't talk about how the night, but do you remember how crazy that night was? <laughs> yeah that was fun then it was a uh, it was somewhere in november we we're like freaking in the middle of nowhere at that time we okay we, we we barely had the iphones but there was no freaking internet it was i think McGrath's range there was no freaking internet yeah. on board you if, if somebody would have died you would probably nobody would have ever known so it's it was pretty insane and then we was like yeah it was a uh, insane few days yeah 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 i remember just like the footage was epic like the light that we got your riding you were like the only dude on the track and then at night was just fucking out of control like if if someone did die i wouldn't have been surprised it was just loose and i was just like <laughs> and then like you just left and i left and i was like jesus fuck jeffrey hurling is a wild child and then that was it i haven't seen you since <laughs> Yeah, true. It was. I think the, the outcome of the, vi of the video was actually pretty solid, and it was. It wasn't the DC days. I remember that when I had a sponsorship with DC, so I had to fly to yeah. US uh, sometime for that. So um, it was fun. It was with Nate Holly and then uh, apparently you guys. So it was a it was a fun video to shoot, and uh, yeah, it was good times to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was only just thinking about it today. I, I've thought about it a couple of times, like just I guess watching your career and racing after because you were super young then dude like i mean you were probably still a teenager then i think it might have been your first maybe trip to america um actually it was 2013 so i was 18 maybe just turned 19 so at that yep. time I was a twice world champion mx2 and um yeah i was young and wild yeah yeah and stuff yeah no <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it was cool. It just, it just made me think like, when you've got that context of hanging out for that weekend or whatever it was, and then you see like the way you ride or the way you are with the media, and like just, I kind of feel like I could see a bit of your personality, and it just made you make sense to me in a way that maybe you don't make sense to some other fans that like don't know that side <laughs> of you, you know? Nah, true, but um, at that time, you know, we didn't have Instagram. Um, the, the complete yep. social media was way smaller as, as, as it is today. Like today, when something happens, you will know within a few minutes, it will be somewhere on Instagram or, or wherever. At, at that time, you just basically have Facebook, maybe a little bit of Twitter, and that's it, you know? So at that time, yeah. you know, now you basically see everything from everyone. Like if you want to know what Chad Lauren's up to, you just probably follow him on Instagram. You probably like know what where he's at and what he's doing. But at that time, nobody really knew. So when you want to see <laughs> yeah. guys, you had to see them at the races or whatever. So yeah, things have changed, but that was they were good days. Nah, that was cool. Uh, yeah, no, nah, I, I was just thinking about that. I was like, I wonder if he remembers that whole deal. But um, so then the first time I ever saw you ride, I remember watching a video, and I don't. This was like so long ago. I'm pretty sure I downloaded it off like LimeWire or something like that. But it was a video of you on an RM85 at the World Junior Champs in Lommel. And I, I'd, I'd heard of Ken Roxon, but I'd never heard of you. 
And I was just like, holy shit, who is this kid riding an RM80 in the sand? So that was the first time I actually saw you ride as well. Yeah, I think I won, I won that world title, I think, in, two, in 2008. Man, it seems like when I say 2008, it seems like so far away. I'm like, yeah, it's a long time ago, you know what I mean? But it was yeah. it was fun. Like, I re- used to race that Max NC. I think he wasn't like a kind of super mini 85 KDM, which was like a rocket. And I was on a Suzuki, like, rah! Yeah. but um <laughs> yeah. yeah so i so I, I won i won that thing but uh yeah and then the year after i moved to i moved to kdm and went to the big bikes but um yeah you know ken roxon was always one step ahead like when he was racing on 85s he was always faster than i was so but he, he was naughty man on the 85 he was like 11 or 12 years old he would throw bubble scrubs like oh look at this guy like this is insane he was like super fast in the 80s yeah, that's crazy to think, man. And, and I was, I, I re watched that video today, actually. Uh, just, I found it still on YouTube. And uh, I was wondering, I was like, man, I bet you second through 10th are just all in the GPs right now. And I just don't know who they are. <laughs> yeah, like at, at that time, it was like Roxton was super hyped up. You know, he was going to be the next big thing. And he turned out to be that one. <laughs> and then just, yeah. I was just a little bit after him. And then, uh, it was just me, Ensty, and Roxon. We were like, yeah, the 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 heavy hitters coming through, you know. Let's say so. Um, you know, Max, he had a bit of a tough time on on the big bikes. Um, he had some good races in Europe, some good ones in America, but never really got a championship. But yeah, me and Kenny, we obviously I won five five titles over in Europe, and he won one one world title. He did win a few outdoor championships, I think, and maybe one Supercross. Yeah, I think he's two. Thing. Yeah, two but and one. Yeah. Yeah, so actually all of us three, we never really had the career we were all hoping for. Like Kenny with the injuries he had on his arm and then I had like multiple of injuries, like not as bad as his ones, but always something. So yeah. for the the talent we've had, we never really, we were a little bit like James Stewart, man. We we were super fast, super talented, but due to bad luck and crashes and whatsoever, we, we were often the fastest, but never really got all the championship in what we kind of deserved, you know? Yeah, no, I I think so too. I um I want to come back to that because I think there's some pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, when I watched that video though, even now, you can just see that you that bike was so slow, right? And when yeah. I ride sand now, to me, I'll ride like a well perfect example. I just did a race in Manjimup on the 450, and it was like gnarly rough, gnarly sand, and I just suck. And the bike feels three million times too fast for me but that's a guy that has never grown up riding sand and then goes and just tries to ride sand whereas with you i was thinking about it today i'm like man the that's maybe the reason why these kids that grow up in the sand are so fast is because they start on a 50 like everybody else but their bike is so fucking slow it's just a turd until they get onto a 250f -hmm. And then even in the sand, a 250F still kind of a turd. So it sort of makes sense in a way that the reason you guys are so fast to grow up in the sand is because you always want to go faster and you're almost like held back by how much the soil weighs you down. And then you have to really learn how to carry momentum from such a young age. So I don't know. It was just kind of a thought I had today. And I guess you're the perfect guy to ask about that. Yeah, true. Like, especially when you're from Holland, like when you have Europe to have sand, you basically only in Holland, we basically have sand. So whenever you see Dutch or even maybe sometime a Belgium GP, there's sand. When you go to Spain, France, Germany, basically anywhere in the world, Italy. it's always yeah. freaking hot, hot. Yeah, Italy, hot, hot back tracks. Again, Italy, you got very few. But basically for that, you know, um, a lot of riders always come to come to Belgium. They like all the top guys basically live in Belgium just because we got sand and it just um, makes you be so much more fit. Like for example, when you live in France, you just ride on concrete tracks. You just like, you don't really even get tired. So um, coming back to your question. Yeah. I think as, as a kid, we always grew up like riding in the sand and it, you always had to work so hard because like you're, you, you needed a fast bike, but you know, I, when I was in the eighties, my parents didn't have a lot of money. So I was basically was riding on a stock bike Every freaking bike didn't go forwards. I, I could get my bikes for free from Suzuki, but like there was some some rich kids standing next to me with a KDM or at that time like a Honda 150, and they were like 
freaking yeah. tune and they were like double the, double as fast as my bike was so i had to really work for that but then yeah once you go to the bigger bikes and you get on a factory bike then it's getting easy you know because then you're finally on the good material and like like when i was on a kid i always had like not the the, the great material and especially on the on the sand tracks on the hard tracks you could solve it with your talent and technique but like on sand tracks you just needed that power and i never had that power so that's why I just freaking always was working hard and yeah, yeah. to get there so is that how it felt though like you spent most of your life wishing you could go faster than what you actually could yeah but sometimes like i even went faster than i than i could and i just freaking yacht sell the shit out of myself like even on the big bike <laughs> sometime i i was in, like in a zone and i went so fast that i felt like i'm going too fast and then it just like and done season done <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i i i had i had those moments yeah yeah, it, it makes sense then that that's why you guys, because then you, you spend your whole life in the sand and then you take it to even a loamy track or hard pack, I guess it's the advantage isn't there as much because you just don't have the same grip. But when you get a gripped up prep track, then you can just, you, you've got this technique that almost like lets you carry more momentum and then now you've got the ground helping you with even more momentum and it, it it seems like that might be the reason why there's so many great world champions that have come from the sand. Yeah, true. And I, th I think when you've been living in Holland and you've been growing up just riding in the sand to adjust to hot pack tracks, it's way easier than from mm. a French kid who only, only been riding on, on, on concrete French tracks with sometime whenever it rained, perfect grip, perfect lines to, to hop into Lommel when there's freaking bumps as, as, as big as yourself and it's just yeah. that's why it, it it takes for them just ages to to learn it like when you see guys like caroli it took them like three four five years they've been living in lomo for like five years or something before they could really start winning in, mm. in in the sand you know and um yeah i think when you've been born in holland it's an advantage because you've been yeah you've been um learning to ride in rain ride in mud ride in sand and that's that's Whenever you live in Spain, for example, you barely have any rain. You just ride on concrete tracks, and mm. and that's it. So I think with Holland, with the temperatures and stuff, and the rain we have, yeah, it, it just it's a little bit like Florida, a little bit of Florida dirt, like mm. sandy, and a lot of rain. We have a lot of rain, so especially in winter. It's uh, it's so crazy when you hear stories like uh, you remember Todd Waters that was racing for Ice One. Um, for Kimmy's yeah. team a, a while ago, so he's yeah. one of my best mates. We grew up, we grew up together um, riding, and I mean he was like a really good sand rider in Australia. Whenever there was a sand round, he was one of the one of the dudes that was going to do well. And then he's it's actually a pretty famous clip now on YouTube of him basically saying Hurlings was ten seconds a lap faster than me at Lommel, and he was a top GP dude. We got podiums and like it's. I find it just so interesting when you can see just how big a difference it is at the top level. And the only thing that's different is what the dirt's made out of that you're riding. You just, you don't see, you're like 10 seconds in one lap at a pro level is just ridiculous. True. I've, I've, I've seen the clip. It was pretty funny when I saw it. But <laughs> when I, when I, when I go to like a second motor level, I just take it like a supercross track because I just want to triple my way for a triple, double, double, triple. And when you can see me, like if you would look back the second motors of a Lirop for me, when I would probably win with like one and a half minute or a Lommel or things like that, I would just all the way like triple, double, triple, double. And then every time when I, I kind of jump, I, I can breathe while other guys are like, yeah, yeah, they probably just freaking hit every bump and it just takes so much energy out of you. So, um, yeah, for me, it's like really fun because when even because I got a private track just next to my house, which is like Lomo 2.0, like it's just super <laughs> rough. And I'm just, really? yeah, I'm just going there for like a freaking supercross track. So, um, yeah, and, 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 and especially late in the second motos when everybody's super tired, they'll go like, rah, rah, and then they just lose so much time. Well, if you just like just take them as jumps and just double your way through everywhere, it, you just keep so much momentum and you'll. I think they go very faster, but yeah. No, oh, it's so cool, man. And so, can you see? So, I imagine you just see you're like the uh, you're like the OG. You're the the king dick in the sand pit, 
and then you just see like new guys like a Jed Beaton. He he moves to Europe and he's like, all right, I'm on a four fifty now. And then you got Todd Waters, and then you got like the French kids, and you just you're seeing all these people come to your sand pit. You probably can just look at them ride and just be like, you suck so bad at this. <laughs> Yeah, but they got better, man. Like, I remember, like, like when I just entered the GPs, it was different. Like, right now, basically, all the top guys are living in Lommel, so they all know a little bit how to ride sand. Like, if you take a French kid like Renault or, the, or even Geyser, you know? When I saw Geyser, like, in 2012, dude, I was laughing at the guy. I saw him ride. I think it was a Lommel. <laughs> I don't even know. I was saying 2012 or 2013. I was like, what the fuck are you doing, my man? But now when I see him right, he's fast in the set, man. So, the, so those guys, they 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 adjust and like even though they go, I don't know if you heard about that place, Sardinia. Um, so they yeah. spend a lot of time there in the winter. So that's actually where the GP was a few few weeks back. So yeah. all of those guys, they know by now how to ride sand. While uh, ten years ago it was pretty funny because then when you saw a French guy ride the sand, <laughs> I was like. Pfft. You, you go get your ass back to my side, my man. You just go there. You don't belong here. <laughs> it's my phone pit. <laughs> yeah. Dude, and that's, how, and that's how it seems. And, and you know, like you just, you hear those, those classic stories of, I mean, I've heard so many riders just go to Europe and then they come back and then they're just like, dude, you have to see it. Like, you just have to see this dude on any given practice day ride that track. And to me, like, as a as a motocross fan and as a nerd of the sport that to me is, it's just such like a crazy this one dude at this one track and it's just like got its own myth about it you know the most funny was when rv came over so he came over in 2015 <laughs> and he, he he just knew tyler retre so my um my at the time practice mechanic which was ruben he he used to work with uh with ricky carmichael and ben downey back in us and then he, he has some connection with Villapoto. So as Villapoto didn't know so many people over here, so he, we got connected. And, and then um, we went to Lomo. So I, I saw him riding Lomo. I, I even said to my mechanic, is that Villapoto riding or did he send his mechanic on track? Because I don't know what the fuck he's doing, <laughs> but he's not he's not fast, man. So I saw I saw Villapoto on, that, on, on Lomo. And I even got videos I, I, I should have sent you. But he, he got better quickly, but he was like, Villapoto was the guy, you know, and, and to me, I, yeah. I like I was a super fan. Like he was always on, on the rear fan of freaking opening that thing like 450. And then I saw him a Lommel and then <laughs> I think Bob Chef, I think his name was Bob Chef, the Russian guy. I don't know if you ever heard about him. He was yeah, freaking yeah, yeah. passing Villapoto and he was like on a, I don't even know what bike he was on. So I was looking like, okay, this guy <laughs> got some work to do. But I think like from Ooh. an American, then if, you ha if you've never been into a place like Lommel, and like they probably leave the track all the week from Tuesday to Friday. And then like somewhere in March, like a lot of kids have holiday and whatsoever. So there are all the kids riding and then that track gets heavy like hell. And then yeah. the track is even like for me, it's like super difficult. And then I saw Villapoto riding. I was like, Oof. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was funny, man. It was it, it it was good. I don't know if you can remember that day, you, but uh, I surely can. He won yeah. hundred. He won hundred percent. Remembers that day. I will guarantee it. Uh, we, I, I, <clears throat> I have to send you the videos, man. Like me and him, I was on a two fifty, and he was on a four fifty. But normally, when when you're on a four fifty. Um, like you should be way faster on Lomo because the sand is so demanding and it was rough and a little bit rained and he just had problems staying there with me man like I, I yeah later I'll definitely send you the video it was so funny um, yeah we had, we had we had a good time he's the, he, anyway That's I sad. hope he doesn't get pissed at me but he's, he, he's still my man Villapoto is, is the man nah dude I was about to say I think he will piss himself <laughs> laughing when he hears that story but I, I love <laughs> I love post racing Villapoto that he's just become the coolest guy. You know, he's one of the guys that when he retired, I thought you'd kind of never see him again. And he would just be like, I'm done with the sport. I'm, I'm going off into the sunset. I made plenty of money. Like, I'm out. But he's gotten cooler after his racing career than when he was the four-time in a row Supercross, like, champion, you know? And I think it's so rad that people nowadays can recognize that we don't want them to leave the sport like when you retire we don't want you to retire and just and dip and i think carmichael did a good job of that he stayed in the sport and he does so much for it and now like stewie's come back with his podcast 
RV is still in the sport. Chad's doing his thing. It's sort of cool to me now to see guys quit racing but not leave the sport. Yeah, I think it's good. But I think the US is even more intense than racing in Europe. Like, we basically start in, in March. We finish in October. And then we got, like, three months off. But the US, like, I even heard Eli Tomek say in his interview, like, physically but especially mentally it's so tough to make like yeah. 18 supercross straight make 12 nationals basically have like before they barely even had time off because it was monster cup but now I've, apparently i think monster cup is not there anymore i don't know but they have a little bit of time off and then go back preparing for supercross so i think with with the u.s schedule is really tough and i could really understand why philip Poto quit on such a young age same with carmichael um they made a lot of money. They won like so many championships in a short amount of time. And I can basically understand, but it's good that they, they stay in the sport because the sport needs ambassadors like them. And I think it's really good that, that they stay around, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good thing. Like you said. Yeah, no, definitely. I can't wait to see those videos. Um, you said before, <laughs> like <laughs> you, you, uh, and Kenny were kind of like the bubbers of, of Europe. I definitely think that you're a hundred percent the bubba of sand and the bubba of probably the bubba of Europe, but a hundred percent, like you're the dude in sand. That's like the craziest motherfucker that's ever done it. And to the, to me, I look, I love technique and I love watching people ride and analyzing people that ride. It's just such a cool part of the sport to me, but I can imagine that you can see like Bubba. Bubba scrub level of shit in the sand or, and you probably know things that you're doing that other people aren't doing that's like a, a different level but just because we we don't even see it the same way as you like we probably don't understand so is there any technique sort of things that you think that like people just don't even know the level that you're playing at when it comes to riding those tracks yeah like i said like whenever i I'm, I just get a smile on my face. Like people, when they go to Lommel GP and then they know second more, they're like, they're already sweating three days before in the bed, like <laughs> second more Lommel, I don't want to be there. But like me, I'm going like, yeah, boy, it's going to be second moto. That's time to shine. So <laughs> I enjoy going there because I know I really enjoy it. And the more rough it gets, I can really work on my technique. Like on, 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 on the hard tracks, you know, you just can go fast and you can go fast and basically everyone can do that shit. But when you go over to, to running deep, deep seriously deep sand you need to have some kind of a skill which not a lot of people have and as i grew up like when i was six years old i was riding those rough tracks when i was 10 years old i was riding those rough tracks so that's where you made a difference you know the same like with with, with euros going over to america with supercross you know when yeah, they, we, yeah. we we would only start riding supercross like at 15 or 16 well in us it would start way earlier and that's why they have that advantage over european guys and um i think that's the same thing with with me and in, in, in the sand and um yeah i think writing sand isn't difficult you just have to kind of understand how it works and um yeah you just have to do it a lot and even raise a lot because when you practice in the sand it's different when you start racing it's uh it's different than than, than practice you know mm. yeah yeah that makes sense too so if you if you like let's say you've got a guy that comes over to europe right or let, let's even say villapoto like before villapoto went out on the track he comes up to you and he's like, hey, bro, I know I'm going to suck at this, but I am a good rider. Can you explain <laughs> how to go fast in sand to me, please, to help me not look like an idiot? The first thing I would recommend to Villapoto when he, he showed up, he freaking had a Pala <laughs> Raceway bike with him. His bike was like a freaking shopper. And then he wanted to go <laughs> around Lommel with his front suspension. Like a freaking, I don't know what he put in there, man. It didn't even move. So I think in the beginning he was a little bit struggling with his, with his, with his, his bike setup, I would think. Because he, he came really American style. You know, American tracks, wide open, fast. Yeah, then you come to Europe, you're like, brap, brap, brap. Yeah, so also the, the, the hard tracks, like when you go to Arco, for example, the E-Race there, when he, when he really doubt, you know, that track's like sketchy, it's hard back, super hard. And then, you know, the, the, the tracks are different. But coming back to your question, yeah, like Philip Oda, he was the guy in Supercross. I would tell him like, hey, man, this is your unlimited Supercross track. It just whoops everywhere. Just freaking jump there around. Like, um, yeah, but it, it's not like it, it, it's so easy, you know. It, it's easy to say like, hey, you have to jump and do this, do that, jump into the turn and sometimes wheel tap and triple and whatsoever but it's not that easy because if it would be that easy like 
every kind yeah, everyone of would do it. idiot yeah. would, would know would know how to do yeah. it. So it's it just recommends a lot of uh, training and desire and heart to even it's like a supercross track like you would crash and then you have to go back up and try again and try again and try again and that's yeah you know it, it just takes some takes some time you know and you have to make the right setup for the suspension you know it's 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 you need a bit of a harder suspension like when you go to hard track you, you or supercross it's completely different for sand you need a very specific kind of setup to to be good at the sand so that takes a little bit of time to require as well and different gearing as well so yeah it just takes takes a bit of time to it's not like i can say in one sentence you have to do this and this and then you'll win a gp yeah. you know it, it, it takes some takes some time yeah oh i bet um and so one thing i've been kind of um watching a little bit especially in the ama stuff man i don't know if you watch i don't know if you're a moto nerd like you're watching all the clips and all the races and stuff but Shout out to Tom at uh, Team Fried slash Racer X for the summer. Those have you been watching those uncut 450 uh, motos that they've been posting? I haven't watched that, but I did watch every single moto like in US uh, 250, 450. I watched every single moto in Europe. So um, I haven't watched the one you just just said, but I did watch every single moto. Yeah, sick. Well, so Tom's been just doing these uncut so it's the entire moto but it's just him walking around the track and i it it's probably better than watching the broadcast and you can just see the technique that the guys are doing and i actually think that at your top level the technique has been evolving quite a lot and i feel like the euro guys are probably uh pretty like there was a time where you could say maybe the us guys were the ones that like had the best technique or whatever but now I feel like it's kind of, there's just a crazy high global standard that you guys are all riding at. And I think the Euros are giving a lot of technique to the Americans as much as the Americans are kind of giving technique to the Euros. But I mean, you see now like standing up, keeping your feet on the pegs. And then there's so many times where I've like paused watching Sexton or Roxon or Tomac in these clips. And there's just like, they're just death grip. There's no brakes, there's no clutch. It just seems like it's just all about like really good throttle control and carrying so much momentum. It's just not the brake and clutch like steer on the rear wheel that it kind of was in Villapoto and Ricky and, and Bubba's day. Um, I don't know if you got any thoughts around that. First thing, well, I think is that the US guys are faster again this year. Like I think over the last two, three, four years, I don't know exactly when, but I think the Euros were faster. But when I see the outdoors today and I see the GPs, um i truly believe the american guys got faster again i think as well as the tracks they allow you to go fast like when i saw hang down when i saw uh fox mm. raceway um and stuff like that 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 those tracks really allow you to go fast and i watched the 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 mxgp last weekend that track looked gnarly hard sketchy so but still i believe like when i saw the pace of of anderson and in, in, in that moto and hang down first moto and when i saw tomek when he was going fast second moto, yeah. i think the Europeans wouldn't have had anything to that speed right now. Um, but yeah, I truly believe that the style has changed. The bikes has changed. Um, like, like at the time when Baba was racing and especially before that, when Ricky was racing, um, the, they didn't have so much to do with electronics and map switches and mappings and stuff like that. Then it was really like true power from the engine and just like you boys just go send it. Well, now there's so much electronical <laughs> shit on the bikes and, um, yeah the, the things have just changed and, and and at those times you truly had like one or two bikes was really better but today you can win on a kdm you can win on a honda you can win on a kawi on a yamaha so the bikes are so competitive the teams are so competitive while back in those days it was way less competition it was just like at one point it was just ricky basically winning everything then at, at one point it was yeah. ricky chad and james and then after that you got like half a minute no one well now chase could win um Roxon could win, Tomek can win, Anderson can win. Uh, there's so many guys who can win. Like even Cooper, okay, he's not racing outdoors, but uh, there's plenty of guys who can win on all different manufacturers. So I think throughout the time things has changed, and also the style has changed. Like when Ricky was racing, he was so super aggressive on that on that clutch. He would probably burn a clutch every time he went out. So um, yeah, yeah, you know things have, things have changed a bit. And how do you think about technique these days? Not just in the sand, but just in general. Like what's the 
what's the um oh i guess like what are you trying to think about the most when you're writing to like really get the most out of you like the most speed out of yourself like i truly believe they shouldn't make the bike faster and faster anymore you need a super super fast bike for the start especially in in the mgp series because um in you in, in america you got the, the tracks are so wide and so grippy and so many lines already you could really pass basically anywhere while in europe when you go to most of those tracks you can barely pass because it's just got one line so you need a super fast bike for the start and the tracks they're still running the same tracks in Europe where they were running like freaking 30 years ago when the bike had half of the power. Yeah. So to me, I believe there's so many injuries because the bikes are just so super fast while the tracks, they're still like 30 years ago. So the bikes kept developing, but the tracks didn't. So um, sometimes I, I believe that the bikes are too fast for the tracks in Europe. I don't believe in America because I believe the American tracks are more safe. They're more wide there. They are, which I believe, I think they're a bit, they're better because they have way more space. Um, but so, yeah, you know, I think uh, once again, a lot, a lot of things has changed and, and the style has changed. And um, I think the, the technique on the bike just kept developing and still developing every single year because everybody wants to have the best bike and better suspension, more power whatsoever, more usable power. And you could also see on, on Supercross, you know, like the, the tracks are, because the stadium is just as big as it is, but the bikes keep yeah. going faster, faster, faster. And I think in the times when, when Baba was racing 125 and, and, and on, a, on the two-stroke days, they could really do something because they didn't have so much power. They could really like do triple, triple, triple. All the other guys were doing double, double, double just because of lack of power. But now yeah. everybody has so much power. It's so difficult to make up ground you know and to do something special because i don't know if you remember the, the days when baba was pulling out some quads on a 125 oh, yeah. and you could you could just do that because he was so much better but today everybody just does the same thing because everybody has that, a lot of power and 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 you cannot do anything special anymore so that's why i think right now if you could see there's so much injuries while in the past it was way less yeah way less mm. injuries because also the bikes were just 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 slower you know yeah yeah definitely so we're, we're, there's probably some good stuff i guess to talk about here just like with topics recently but i didn't know as much and maybe you guys are running a, a bit of different stuff in europe because you guys actually have unlimited factory bikes but do you think that we're starting to get into the territory where there's too much electronics because so i know like casey stoner he would always say i wish there was no electronics in moto gp because it's it's crazy in that sport what they can do but do you think like at your factory level do you think teams are really starting to try and introduce electronics in like the way that moto gp it's like sort of went into moto gp the way it did yeah like when we're testing in the winter they can just like a few horsepower away just by changing the acu box you know they can whether just like putting my bike on a computer and probably it works the same with a honda or a kawasaki or yamaha where the acu you just put a computer on there it's like a like a video game they just put the power wherever they want and you just have way more power way less power and, and things like that so that's just how it works and you could see with with formula one it's just mm. uh, the, the 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 rider isn't super important it's all about the car and it's same with moto gp a bit and it, it also motocross gets into that direction you know there's so much electronics um on the bike and it's it's getting so much more important um, which is also a good thing because it, it shows the sport is developing. But mm. I, I believe in motorsport, it's still the rider who makes a difference. It's not like in Formula 1 that you need to be in that kind of car to be able to win. Yeah. But yeah, it just makes you as a privateer, as a privateer, you cannot work up to those factory teams because if you're not on a factory ride, you don't have the, basically don't have the options to, to get that material and to get that product. So um yeah, you know, like back in the day, you could even win with a with a basically with a stuck 250 two stroke and just mm. work a bit on the cylinder and make it a bit faster, and you could basically win. But now there's so much electronics involved and 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 people involved. And uh, back in the day, you just had one race mechanic. That's it. Now you have a mapping mm. guy, you have this guy, you have that guy. So um, yeah, things things have changed. I don't know if it's positive. It, I wouldn't say it's negative. It just uh, yeah. Makes the times are changing. Um, yeah, changing, so right? so when I had Jed on here and he was he pretty much said the same thing. He's like, dude, the bikes are just so fast. And 
I, I wonder why, like, or is it maybe it's even a thing where, like, why don't you just have this just ridiculous bike for the start? And then basically, as soon as you've got through that first turn or maybe the first four laps or something, you've got the option where you click it and then it just detunes the thing and you just go into just like moto mode. Like, Would that be too hard to adapt to? And that's why you don't do it because it sounds like you have the technology there to do it. Or are you, or are you kind of like worried that you'd be giving away the advantage to the other riders? No, nah, to be honest, I got that mode. Like I got that mode that it's, it's, it's full power for start. And then once you go, uh, when I, once I, I don't know if like a few seconds or minutes, whatever, I don't know exactly what it is, but then it just, uh, the power will uh, be less. Um, but still you got that hardware, you know, you got that cylinder, you got yeah. the, the, the yeah. engine is, has been set up. So you with the AC, you, you can do that much, you know, if you want to do more, you have to go to a slower engine, you know, and then work from there. So, yep. but still, you know, I, I it, it, it's not as easy as it, as it looks. I mean, yeah, we, we, we got that option. Probably all teams, top teams will have the option yeah. to have like a start mapping. And then once you shift to third or after 30 seconds, after releasing the clutch, it will it will kind of go. I don't know exactly. Every bike will probably be different. But um, but still, then, yeah, the power will, will reduce to, to, to less. But still, you got the hardware of the engine. And still, yeah. even if the, yeah. if the power reduces, it's still like freaking an airplane, you know? So... Uh, yeah. and then you're coming yeah. back to the American tracks and European tracks, like on American tracks, you could really handle it. Like I've seen the last three races, full grip, fast, plenty of lines. And then you get to the European tracks. Like if you, I don't know if you've seen MXGP last weekend, like the, the, the last moto was like super, super slick, super it's hard. It's always crazy just bad basically, there. Yeah. Basically just one line, everybody trying to follow, uh, couldn't really pass. So that's why on, on European tracks, you, you need that for the start. But then at the same time for racing in America, you can use that power, but in, in Europe, it's, it's hard to use it because it's just that the tracks are different, you know? Yeah, no, you, you're so right. And it, it does, I mean, it's kind of almost a criticism of the U S at times because the tracks are just so similar, but I mean, it's been really impressive the last four weeks just watching, like you said, there's so many fast guys. Like, shout out Christian Craig, dude. You know, even him on a 450 has been, he's been a beast. Like, there's so many guys that in that 450 class that have just been absolutely sending it. The bikes are fast as fuck. The tracks are fast as fuck. And it's been really cool to watch. And no big crashes, you know. No, I think it, it relies again to the track because the tracks are really safe, you know. And I think, yeah, the 450 uh, outdoors are really nice to watch. I've been watching every single motor and I, and I love it because I think Chase Chase is really fast. Um, I can't believe he crashed last lap, man. He, he, he got Same, that thing, dude. you know, he could have won. That was a that was a rookie mistake, I would I would think. But he, he he's super fast to me until now. He's been he's been the fastest guy around and um, especially the first the first uh, two motos at Fox Raceway. He was just really dominating and then. Uh, and hang down he was twice he was like like uh behind jason just within a second i think on on, on, the, yeah. on the finish line same with eli and then last weekend he, he had this thing um uh, in his back pocket but he uh, he just stepped over and uh um yeah that was that was a kind of a silly mistake but at the same time i think if you look at the championship until now you know you're we're 25 percent in three out of 12 uh, rounds uh, has been done i think for now chase has been um the most consistent and I think the fastest, uh, but Eli, like when Eli is on a roll, oof, I don't want to raise this guy when he, when, when, when he's, when he's on a roll, yeah. this guy is on a roll and then he's fast, man. Then, then there's no one in the world who probably can match the speed. I, at least I, I don't think I, I'm, I'm able to do it when he's on a roll, but you know, his off days are like, sometimes are too much off. Like it's, it's off day in Fox mm. raceway. Um, that's, he lost too much points, but then the second motor and hang when he just, Close in, close in, close in. He just passes me like he puts some laps down. You're like, dude, this dude is fast, man. And I remember also yeah. the Kawi days when he was right, racing Dungey and a Supercross, and he would came from tenth to ninth to eight. He would charge all the way to the to first, and then he would just, yeah, this dude could can be super fast, man. Baba was fast, but Eli Tomac on a good day, oof. Dude, 2015 Eli Tomac. Remember those when he just won every moto by like a minute and a half until he crashed at Colorado. His last year on the Honda. Oh, when he yarselled, he, he freaking yarselled. Both his shoulders popped out. Both and shoulders. Like, season over. Yeah, yeah. I remember. He Dude. Was, he, he was like... Hangtown that so year. That's why Dungey... Woo. Yeah. But that's why Dungey won so many championships because he was just always consistent. Like, 
at that time, like now there's like five, six, seven guys who can win. But at that time, it was like two or three guys. It was Kenny, it was Eli, and yeah. that was basically it at the time. So, but still, when Eli was on a roll, he was super fast. But Ryan was always there, like second, third, second, third win. And just because of that, he won he won his championship. Because like when he was facing Villapoto, which was consistent and fast, he could never really do it. But like he was always more consistent than Kenny. And that's why he won a 15. That's why he won a 16. And 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 yeah and then he won a 17 again just by being being consistent in supercross and then he basically never really had any major injuries so that's something very impressive in this sport especially racing supercross plus yeah. uh, outdoors to uh, i don't know what he has he maybe broke his back once like i think it wasn't yeah um, the colorado think, colorado as well and then yeah. and then he broke his collarbone once well i believe but for the rest I, I i don't even know if he ever had any injuries so for racing 10 years on a professional level that's pretty impressive Dude, yeah, um, I completely agree. <laughs> Man, Ando has impressed the shit out of me outdoors this year. I mean, for all that I talk about technique and just like how good Chase looks and just how perfect that guy can be on a bike, I will admit it was really cool to just watch an absolute dog chase him down in that in that first moto at Hangtown. He had a six-second lead. And it's like you watch Chase ride picture perfect just hitting every single mark and then you've just got this dude on a cowie with both legs off doing the splits just full send mode and then he runs you down and then wins the moto i mean when i watched that moto again um you could see that ando had way better lines like there was some lines that he was making like once he figured out his lines he just ate that six seconds up but it was so cool to watch a guy with legs off and just fully sending it to the moon past the perfect technique guy and win the moto. Like, it just gave hope to all the senders out there, you know? Yeah, true. And I, I remember because I was watching that moto and I was already knowing... I, was, I already knew where he was going to pass him. And at, at the same time, I knew where he was, he was taking that time. It was like a little double into the turn before a right-hander. And Chase was like, mm -hmm. single, single, and he went right. And this he got, I, yeah. I don't know exactly which part of the track it was, but I don't know if you remember. And he really, really take like a second. And then you went right there, so straight after it. Fizzle. And then right, and he had like a little uphill double, turn left, and then go yeah. down. So that so there he, he took a lot of time to chase. But yeah, I, I love his style, man. I, 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 I erased an awesome. It was the Motocross of Nation. Yeah. He had a tough time there, man. I don't know where he finished, but I remember him <laughs> being down a few times. But I love his style, man. Like, he's always, like, on the back of the fender, ripping that thing, his, his, his jersey hanging out of his pants, like, Rah! But I love, um, yeah, I love his style and, and the way he writes. And I think on Supercross, he finished really strong. Like, I think he won the last four main events or something. Four, yeah. So, he, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, lo I love the way he... he the way he is, the way he's on Instagram and stuff, he's like, like, <clears throat> but they had to like, I don't give a fuck, you know, you know that kind of attitude. Yeah, so yeah. I love to see it, and and then he just posts some shit sometimes, and he doesn't even care like when Basha took him out or stuff. Like he's like, oh whatever, it doesn't matter. And he's 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 a tough guy on the track as well because he's not he's not a bam bam kind of rider, but he's not scared to give you a little love yeah. tap as well. So I I love watching him ride, and yeah, he's clean and he's fast, and I love his style. So uh, yeah, he's 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 cool. So while we're while we're just full AMA bench racing, which is pretty rad, by the way. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of uh, of your boy Kenny? Because it's been an up and down few years. I'm so happy to see him get an overall, and I mean, I think he's been the second best dude in the series behind Chase. But what do you make of his struggles over the last few years? And what do you think about? I guess the way that he's kind of like he pulled out a supercross, and then it's like no Instagram, and then it's back on it. Like, what do you make of just the whole program? Like, his opening laps, they're pretty gnarly. Like, he always, well, he was basically behind Caroli because he always holds shot it. But then um, he was behind Tony. He passed him. And then his opening lap is freaking insane. Like, he would pull, like, four-second lead or something. He did that in, in Hangtown, second moto. And then he did the same thing in, in, in Lakewood, Colorado. Like, he would pull, like, a few seconds in the first lap. So, his, his opening lap is really strong. And um, his starts are good. Um, but he, since he had that, like, I've had a lot of injuries as well. So, I know... In kind of which position he's in every injury is different but he's not the same kenny as it was the kenny before his crash like when he was on the suzuki days and when he just turned to honda whoa, he was so fast like um he won his first, first two main events and he looked so good and you could see after his crash with his arms he got a bit scared i think which is totally normal and he almost lost one of his arms so um yeah. i think with that injury he should be thankful and happy to be still racing and 
you can just see he doesn't take that amount of risk what he used to before that i believe because i rarely see can he make a big crash like he would never like what i remember that after his, his his crash with his arms in 2017 um i've never really seen him make any big crashes well the one with Webb where he broke his hand again but it wasn't even a big mm. crash but after that like in the last three years i can't remember he had any big crashes so i think he's just playing it safe um and it, it, it's really it's a little bit inconsistent like like last year he would like win a race by 10 15 seconds and next to the race he would finish eight so i don't really understand where, where that's coming from but still to me kenny is the most talented rider out there um you can see he's a bit limited with his with his position on the bike due to his arm injuries but he definitely he's a little bit like baba and like me i believe like he hasn't won enough championship to his capability because i think yeah. he should have won minimum one or two supercross championships for 50 and he should have won way more and i i spoke to him a little bit in, in the past few months and i know he's been struggling with it with a sickness um maybe that came to all the surgeries he's had i think he had like 10 surgeries on his arm in, mm. in that period when when he had that arm problem so i believe you know due to all those injuries and 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 pain he had and and uh medicines you had to take you know it, it's not good for your body so i think that has something to do with it and then being in in a motocross which has uh 30 races a year you would travel all around the country all the time it's just super super tough on your body anyway and then to do it with a body which is not 100 yeah. anymore due, due to that arm injury i think it's really tough and i think you know he, he took that summer off and he got his, his kid um i think yeah you don't get a kid every like 10 times in yeah. life so i think it's something you should really enjoy so I've, and 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 with his results not being in, in, at top at that time i think maybe it was a good decision but then to pull out a supercross due to his health it was it was tough because i think he's in his contract year so um you know especially with honda you know chase he's being he, he basically took over his role you know uh for the moment yeah. I, i'm i don't know how, how how those are gonna turn out but chase is a bit the guy to beat right now then you have those two lawrence brothers they're all on honda so they basically have a lot of top guys at Honda. Um, the yeah, you know, I think Kenny's on a pretty high salary. So, um, so he because he was used to be the winning guy and he was paid to basically win. And now you got so many guys who are able to maybe take over his role. It, it's definitely not easy mentally because he has the pressure now. He, he kind of needs to perform. So, yeah, you know, um, he's in a he's in a tough spot. You know, he's uh, so talented, so good. And just the results hasn't shown it, He's shown his full potential, I think, due to all the health issues and whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm really curious how to, this thing will turn out and what his future is gonna 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 bring. Like, and wh whatever bike he's gonna be racing, maybe you know, but um, yeah, that's that's something. Yeah, looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't know where where he's going, but um, or you know, if he stays at Honda. But I think that's probably the thing that people don't really remember is that we're just so lucky to have Ken Roxon still racing. I mean, he's still. If you talk about the superstars of the sport that are active and racing right now, he is one of the top five superstars in the sport and we almost lost him like he he almost never raced a bike again and i guess you know it's so like right now you're like man i wonder where he's gonna end up and he pulled out with this and he pulled out with that but it's like at the end of the day we're just still lucky that the dude actually is racing with that injury that he got and i guess it goes to show almost how good he is that everyone still expects him to win after having this crazy injury that almost cost his entire career. So it's almost like he's so gifted that he creates these questions uh, about his future and about his results. And, you know, when, when you just step back and look, you're like, wow, we're just so lucky this dude's even racing. Yeah, true, because that was like a career-ending crash, basically. You know, it could have been a career-ending crash. And it took him a year to recover from that, and maybe even longer, but he was he was out, for, out of competition for a year so um we should be so lucky to still have him like you can see on instagram i think he's the most followed rider on on internet like on, on social mm, media probably. kind of you know he he is he's so hyped up and and everybody kind of loves him in europe and i think the same in, in in america so he's a he's a big factor for our sport and it would be sad to to miss a guy like him you know he brings so much back to the sport and 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 like you said like everybody's like oh roxon isn't winning dude this guy should freaking 
pray in, in, in the church every single week. He still got both his arms, you know. He should he he was meant to maybe not even ride anymore. So for him to be riding and to, to still be winning main events, win outdoors, is like a God's miracle. Yeah. And then you can see how talented and how gifted he is. So for me, I can understand, you know, like I, I don't see many riders who which have had that injury would come back this way. So for me, yeah, he, like I mentioned before, he's what I believe the most talented rider in the U.S. right now. And you can see the way he can ride a bike, sometimes how he scrubs, how he whips, his technique with his foot. Like he would go through turns like both feet on the pegs and just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's just gifted and talented. That's all I can say about him. And uh, I hope for him he, he still wins a lot of races and hopefully one day he wins the Supercross Championship because that's, I know it's been his dream and um, he, ha he didn't achieve it yet. So hopefully, you know, his age is not um, getting any younger anymore. So hopefully he can still get a championship at Supercross because that's the, the, the main goal when you go to US. So hopefully he can achieve it. And uh, yeah, for the rest, I wish him all, wish him all the best. It's one thing that I've always been impressed by with you is that it seems like no matter how bad your injury is or how long you're out for, it just does not matter when you get back on the bike. I mean, I think you could probably argue that you have three or four rounds where you're struggling to just get the race fitness back. What? But in terms of your ability to just be a fucking animal, <laughs> like that just, it just <laughs> never seems for an injury to take that away from you. And I don't know why that is. It's all, it's got to be just mental. Yeah, it's all mental. Like now I, I seen this as a break. Like I was always rushing to get back to racing. And now KTM basically has said, like, okay, take the year off and, and come back next year and come back winning and winning away. So I could have come, came back in May, um, but then I decided to get away with the team to, cause I had an injury in, in 2019 where I shut up my foot and, I still needed another surgery, but I never really had the time to do it. And then I had a plate on the left side where I broke my heel in and a photo shoot crash. Stupid me. In January. So I had to get that plate removed because it was bothering. So now I think it it, it really... Uh, I took this one as a break because right now I, I'm not really training or anything at all. I just take this as a break to really have a few more good years coming. Um, I'm 27 right now and I would like to race for like three, four more years. And... Um, you know, I, I've, I've won five world, world titles. I've, I've lost a few when I was really, really close to them uh, due to injury. But, like, I think uh, the, the injuries are really mental um, at times because, like, like my right foot, uh, I was always, it was always bothering. It was always painful. So when, then you're going back to Kenny when it's maybe limit, uh, because of it, you're limited in your riding, then it's not only mental anymore because then also the body stops you. And I had a little bit of feeling that it was mm. stopping me. So now I hope um, it's going to be all solved. And as a racer, you always get pushed kind of like, hey, you have to come back because, hey, we're paying you. You know, you need to win. You need to perform. You need to race. That's just, I think that's how it goes, you know, because the team, the teams, don't, they don't want you to sit at home, which is normal because they're basically paying you to go out there racing. And um, like this year, I just I just took took time for myself. Like, okay, okay I'm going to get a fix. I'm going to get healed up. And next year is going to be my contract here too because uh it's my currently my my last year with kdm and um yeah it's going to be a very important year especially with this year being off and everybody knows what i'm capable of because if you could see the last years whenever i was there and when i raced the full mm -hmm. series i basically won the championship so um and the riders they know it i know it and and um but yeah my problem is to just finish finish a year and i think i may I made a lot of crashes just by being dumb. Like like this photo shoot crash, just wasn't focused. Like, bah, 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 rip it, and then like, yeah. shh, big crash. Just because I wasn't focused. Same in 2019. So the last two major injuries I had, they were just unlucky. And just because I was dumb and just not focused. I never really had like big injuries while I was in competition or whatsoever. But mm. it seems like I've been made out of glass, man. When I touch the ground, I freaking break a bone. So, uh, um, yes, the, the injuries are tough in our sport. And... Um, yeah, it's part of it. What What do you think mentally, though? Well, I guess, have you had any injuries that have been really hard to come back from? Like the crash was really scary or it could have been... I mean, there, you had that crash where you, you had your neck or your back and it's like, have you had some crashes that were mentally really hard to come back to and you just found a way to push your way through it? Or 
have you always just naturally been like once it's done you're just able to put it in the back of your mind and then you're able to be the fastest dude in the world again because that seems like it'd no, be a when challenge it's done, yeah it definitely is a challenge but when it's done it's done and like that neck thing i, I was paralyzed for like an hour and it's like they put the freaking electric back in the in the wall like whoof, everything started working again you know like like really I feeling, and then yeah it was so crazy like no. I crashed it, it was in faenza warm-up and then i jumped my 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 leg came off and then i hit my head in the ground and i did like a front flip but my neck uh basically was stuck in the mud so mm. i broke one vertebra in my neck i think it was c1 which is the most dangerous one because if you really break it bad you will be like paralyzed from your chin downwards so at that point, oh. I didn't have feeling from my chin downwards, and um, but it was like a very, very small crack. But it just from the the impact it got, it just got like a, like kind of a shockwave, whatever it's called. Like, um, so I didn't have feeling for a while, and then like after like I don't know half an hour, one hour, it's like they like like I just mentioned, like they put the electricity back on, like everything started working. And, and I, I, even the day after, I didn't have any pain because it was just like a like they could barely see it on the scan, like a small, small crack in it. But then yeah, the doctor said, okay, like hey don't start riding with this thing because i could basically ride the next weekend if i really wanted to but you know if i would crash on it again and it would yeah, yeah nah. <laughs> you don't want to be messing around with something in your neck man nah. then that's not worth it so um so i decided okay because then it wasn't the corona time they had like three races like sunday wednesday sunday week off sunday wednesday sunday so like basically six weeks later then the season was up anyway so um uh, we decided to sit out that year um but for the rest i never like even with, with the foot both of my feet which are got badly injured uh because for the rest i didn't have so many injuries but uh both of them the crashes were really silly and really stupid like i yeah, yeah you've seen probably my photo shoot crash um just went over the bars and just landed on my feet and then i was actually straight walking up and i was like ah, ja, ja, it hurts it hurts and then i was like okay i get a plane fly back home and actually wasn't too bad and then you come up like oh shit my heel is kind of exploded so um um yeah i never really had major major big crashes but you know for me once it's done it's done and i know when you're racing dirt bikes you know the risk you know the risk of you can it sounds really hard what i'm gonna write say right now but you know the risk you can die you know the risk you can get paralyzed you've seen a lot of riders got paralyzed unfortunately you know the risk of breaking bones and it's basically every single weekend somewhere out there you know <laughs> you're breaking bones like in the us or in europe you know you see oh this guy broke his collarbone this guy broke his femur this guy broke this so you know the risk of racing dirt bikes you know if not i should have played i don't know on a, on a guitar or something then i know nothing would have happened <laughs> but i know the, the risk of it so um now nah, i'm well aware and for me when it's done it's done try to heal up and come back and i don't plan on racing another 10 more years you know i i want to do three four more and then i'm done <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, obviously, well, I know that you're just a guy that's obsessed with motocross, too. You know, I mean, you can even hear, like, you know everything about every rider. You've, you're watching everything. I know that you're an all-in guy when it comes to training and what you demand of the team. And the, it, it's like, motocross is your life. You're one of those guys where, and, and not, I guess, motocross in terms of it, even as a hobby or fun or whatever. It's just like, you're here to win world championships that's kind of it and uh i think that you know to keep up that intensity your entire life and then deal with the injuries and then you know everything that else go, goes along with it it's just not a thing you can do into your 40s no definitely that's why i think you know i'm 27 now so i'll be 28 29 30 31 so that's i think in europe that's a nice age i think in us it's been pretty nice because they used to stop at 26 27 now they're going into the 30s almost like Jason, he's almost getting 30. Muscan was like 32. Eli's getting into the 30s almost. So um, I think it's good that they extend that their, their careers a bit in the US too. And in Europe, normally they extend a bit even longer. So I think racing till the early 30s is, is nice. And at one point, you know, you want to have kids and you want to... The life changes, you know, when you're 16, you're just all out war. Like, just go out riding, riding, riding. Even if you... If they would have sent me for three months to Spain in the winter, I wouldn't care. But now you're like, okay, you want to be home a bit more and you want to think about different things. And due to the age, things change. And also the risk, you know, when you were 16, I didn't see any risk. Now sometimes like, okay, shut down the gas because it's enough, <laughs> you know. So I think that comes with age. Like when you go to Supercross, when you see like the 16 years old, they would just send it, you know. And then you see yeah. guys like Eli, Kenny, Jason, they have so much experience, they have so many injuries. They're a bit more like... Okay, we just do our thing and keep us safe and things like that so um 
yeah, I think in Europe, early 30s, then it's been a good day. Yeah, it's been a good run. Um, when you were saying yeah. before that you just, the, the couple times you've just lost that little bit of focus, why do you think it it is? Because, I mean, is it the fact that you're spending so long on a bike? Like, you were just on a motorcycle. You, in no injury time, is probably, you're on a bike more than maybe any other rider. And do you just think that it's easy for you to get, like, lose a bit of focus because you're just on the thing so, so often? Yeah, basically the, the crash I had in Spain just because it wasn't focused because I was it was my sixth day straight on a bike because we were we were testing or, or I was at least I was riding like Thursday now it was Wednesday Thursday Friday we were testing a bit I believe then on Saturday Sunday I made a Spanish championship for whatever, whatever reason I did that one and then on the Monday we had a photo shoot so it was my sixth day I got some blisters we came back from the race like 12 in the night the day before. We expected it to be nine at the photo shoot. So had a short night of sleep. We're still tired. Had to get all the shit together for that photo shoot. Yeah. It just wasn't focused. And it, I don't blame anyone. I just blame myself because I knew that photo shoot was on that Monday. But I decided to go race somewhere in the middle of Spain and, and, and things like that. Just, you know, when I'm on, I'm on. When I'm off, I'm off. So And, and I think that's also because I've been, like you can see in the results, like I've been winning so much or either I'm, I wasn't there. So um yeah you know i i i was really extreme in, in training as well like even like now i'm a little bit chubby i'm not i don't, I don't give a shit <laughs> but when i'm on i'm on you know then like i'm super super lean um i'm then i'm i'm yeah i'm, I'm ready to send it so um yeah maybe because i've been riding so much because like even between races i would always ride tuesday wednesday thursday and then race yeah. on the weekend and maybe that's been too much and it's something what i like now i've been sitting on the couch and been you know, uh, I'm trying to, to heal up from the surgeries I've had and um, and just healing. And then you can say like, hey, maybe if I write less, it will be maybe better, you know, and have more productive time instead of be just yeah. like now we just went to the tracks. Like, okay, yeah, we went to ride today, but was it productive? I don't know. Just blast out two motos, but do the same thing in 24 hours and do the same thing in another 24 hours. And then we go to the race. And sometimes I even showed up at the race like I was just tired. But I was like, if I knew like and like end of last season when i was battling for the championship if i would just see guys who are fair for training i even would come and get like hey get in with the bike like they're riding i need to be riding you know so like if i knew they would have done two motors i would have gone out i would have done three and and that's basically why tim has won this championship like in in 18 and in 21 when i was there he didn't win and he just won in 19 and, and even in 20 i was leading after six rounds i was leading by 60 points he just won because I, I, I clean myself out and I clean myself out again this year. So, like, if you look to all the championships we've raced, he never beat me straight up in a championship. In 2015, he won a championship. I was leading by 150 points until I, 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 I you know, I took myself out of the championship. And it was the same in, in, in 2017. You know, I missed, well, I did the first four races, but it just broke my hand like seven days before the first opening round. So, the first four races really suck, but I, I lost the championship due to myself. So always I lose kind of the championship by cleaning myself out, and that's pretty frustrating. And um, yeah, and and no one, I just got five championships. Well, I should have had way more, but it should have, could have, would have. You know, it doesn't make any sense, but um, it's something to to consider for the future as 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 my age is clicking too. Yeah. And I I know I just have a few more attempts. I don't have ten attempts left, so I know there will be only a very few. So. Uh, yeah we'll see you gotta yeah you gotta win the ones that you're there for i w I won the ones i was there when i'm not there I, or yeah. I, but yeah. yeah yeah like I, I think the last 10 years i won five championship and lost five so i think the average is like 50 yeah. percent. so could have gone better when now uh, <laughs> when uh when i spoke to Searle on the podcast he uh and i actually think this is really great advice for just life in general but Searle said that one of the things he learned from Tony was that Tony was always fine with putting the bike down and putting the tools down and disconnecting from motocross and being really confident in himself that he did what he specifically needed to do to be the best. And what you're describing is that old school dog championship mentality where it's mm -hmm. i'm gonna win every championship by outworking everybody and you're right man like when you say this is it's actually the thing that i love about you is you just say it exactly how it is like you it's it sounds cocky 
but then at the same time, it's like, well, it's a completely factual statement. So I don't know how this is cocky if it's bang on the money true. So, you know, you, what you're describing in a sense is that, you know, you just wanted to bury these dudes. And when you were there, you did. But that attitude that lets you bury those guys often it was either you buried them or you buried you but either way someone was getting buried and you see a guy like tony and he's won 10 championships and he just would go on the lake in in italy and would go out on the boat for the afternoon and and what you said of calling a mechanic because you saw someone else riding tony's literally the exact opposite of that and it's just but then again, it's like, can you even do that? Because this is your personality. Like, this is who you are. You're the dude that's going to bury everybody. Yeah, true. And it actually, it's pretty funny, you know. Like like you said, like, half of the times I buried myself, half of the times I buried the competition. But, um, yeah, he. it's true. Like, I, I remember Tony, like, sometimes I was there, like, in summertime. Sometimes it gets hot and all. I was like, I remember that day I was riding here, like, deep deep sand like really rough and i would just came off the bike like like completely done like like florida humidity <laughs> hot just blasted out two motors and then i opened my phone and i see freaking caroli sitting on his yacht or boat or whatever he was on <laughs> on on the freaking lake with his chick with some friends seeing some whatever he had on that boat kind of drinks and i was just like the water was tripping over my face and i was like what the fuck you know <laughs> and then but still he he did he did what worked for him you know and i think it did work yeah. he won nine championships and for some reason he he made it work like he was so different like he would even be on a gp like sometime on thursday night and i would like just fly there as late as i could so i could put in the work even the days before and like even when the second moto was done i would have my suitcases ready to fly out already to go home to start training again while he was like like really Italian style, like taking it easy, no rush, yeah. just chilling, eating pasta with his with his buddies, and and I was there on my freaking lean Eldon Baker kind of salad program, and um, <laughs> yeah, you just everybody makes it works for 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 themselves, and I I think I got a special way of trying to make it work while Kaiser has his way, Caroli had his way, and yeah, everybody has their own way of of doing it, and 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 I think eventually everything. Is makes or breaks with results because when I was in that program, everybody tried to follow. Then when Tony was in that yeah. program and he was winning, everybody tried to follow that program. Like I remember, like in twenty, from twenty uh, two thousand five till twenty fifteen or sixteen when or seventeen when when every guy was winning the the Supercross series was Eldon Baker's program. So everybody tried to copy. Mm what Eldon was doing, you know? So you had those, those, those trainers in the U S they're like, Oh, Eldon does this. We have to do the same thing. So it's, and, and, and that's just how it works. Everybody tries to do, do, do what the winner does, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. Do you, and I, that's kind of, I guess the, uh, I, I think when, when Searle said that I could kind of relate to my own life a little bit when he, when he explained the way that, that Tony was, because Man, like, I woke up at 5.30 this morning and I've been thinking about work until right now. I mean, even... Uh, uh, this is one of the podcasts that I've been the most excited to do in so long. And on my phone, like, knowing you're on the way, I'm, like, going through things that I'm going to do for work tomorrow. And <laughs> it's some... It, that's why I'm doing good with work or whatever. And that's the same reason why, you know, you have had the results that you have like there's this sort certain like obsessive personality that you can kind of have that it's required in a way to like get to a certain level but then i think that there's probably a point where you go okay i've reached this level and now it's not gonna it, it doesn't just keep going up forever like you've kind of got to get to a a spot and then you've got to create some sort of balance and some kind of you know, like putting the tools down and being able to go on a boat and then not feeling guilty when you do it and not feeling like you're that voice in your head being like, you're going to lose on the weekend. What if Tim's riding? What if, you know, so it's really hard to get that balance and, you know, to hear the way that Tony went about that career, I'm kind of like, damn, well, maybe I should try and apply some of that to my own life in a way. I think everybody can in yeah, a way. Tr yeah, true. And I think, you know, you just need to be passionate about what you do because if you if you just go into your job 
and do it because it's your job and you do it for the money you will not get out of it what you want to get out of it like every day when i went to training and when i went to cycling like it wouldn't have mattered if i if i would have cycled one mile an hour slower i wouldn't have changed the rest on the weekend but i would try to go as fast as i could just because i was passionate about it I, I i wanted to train hard i wanted to win and i think you know you should always go through your work just like you said just because you have a lot of passion for it and just enjoy doing it and you want to do it and and the top guys in each sport like they're not money driven for sure money is a motivation in a in a, in a particular particular way but for example uh, uh, cristiano ronaldo he's 37 years of age he doesn't need to play football because he needs that money he can yeah. buy everything he wants yeah. in the world basically so he does it because he's passionate about vo- uh, football and he wants to do it and and same with me with right race and dirt bikes i think same with a guy like eli tomek he's made enough money he just wanted like apparently like he went to yama because he just felt that that was a good change for him to to win that supercross championship and and he said in an interview i don't know if you heard about it he said like apparently he signed for less and he could have gone with kawasaki mm. i don't know if it's true i just read an article i don't even know if, if he really said it or not i just read it somewhere in the internet but it just shows you he doesn't care about that money he just wants to win and if he thinks being on that uh, star racing yama project um to give him an advantage to make him be better on the bike and being better on the weekends that's just because his passion for winning it's not for the money yeah. so and i'm in the same way like i don't i just want to win and and whatever it takes I'm, I'm willing to do it and sometimes i just get too passionate about it and i just yeah like you said i'm burying myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean it, it's uh it's one of the things too that kind of sticks in in my mind uh from a book i read it's called atomic habits and so he basically said that you shouldn't care about your goals you should only care about your processes and he used the 800 meter final at the olympic sprinting as the example you've got the best eight people in the world and they've all got the same goal of winning an olympic gold medal but only one of them does it so the goal actually doesn't matter it's the the way that you approach the processes and the every day and like what you just said about cycling you could go one mile an hour slower, but that ain't going to get you the, you know, the gold medal in the final at the end of it because it's the it's not the guy that wants to win the world championship that wins the world championship. Like Tim wanted to win the world championship the year that you won it, but you obviously just did something else differently that kind of like let you do it. And I think so many people in like their everyday life, they get focused on the goal instead of the process like what's going to get you to win that in in your case it's the world championship uh not you know what is your goal no true and i I totally agree with you on that one like the true winner will always do that little step extra because at that like that level you just said when you have the 800 meters uh running like all eight of them they know how to run but the guy who won he probably just did a little extra what the other guys didn't like that's what I always try to do. And on a level, on a high level, as what we're doing in motocross, everyone has a lot of talent. Like even the guy who finished 20th, he still has a lot of talent. Big time. But Massively. Uh, but yeah, like a, a guy like Jet Beaton, he's really talented as well, you know. There's there's so many guys who have a lot of talent and just, um, okay, in motocross, you sure have that little difference, you know. Um, there, there are not... Uh, 15 Ken Roxas riding around. There's not 15 Jorge Prados riding around. So, but when you have that talent and then you have that work ethic, that's then you're like, you're there. Mm. But where you need did both that them, work you know? ethic? Well, yeah, where did that come from in you? Because you've just been like, I just find it so crazy to see a guy like you now at you know 27, 28 years of age. And just know that you've been grinding for the same thing since you were eight years old. And to to do it that long and to be that much of a savage for that many years, you've just got to really want that shit. And that's got to come from somewhere deep, deep inside. Like there's a, like you said, you can't be motivated by money or girls or fame or anything and put yourself through the torture that you would have put yourself through in your career. No, true. But I feel I need that work ethic because for sure i'm talented but i know i do not have the talent of jorge prado i knew 
I do not have that talent of Ken Roxon, maybe even so. Um, but with that hard work ethic, I know I have enough talent to make it work. Like I said, maybe not the talent they have, but with that work ethic on top of it and the desire of how bad I want to win, I feel like I could have made it work. You know, if I, if I would have done less, I don't know if I could make it work, you know, like, um, because because those top guys have a lot of talent but they maybe just do not have that that last bit of desire what i've had or had um so and the risk what they were willing to take because it's not talent is one thing but you, have, you need to have the desire you need to have the work ethic and you need how much risk do you want to take because sometimes i had to go 110 percent to stay up with guys and to eventually beat them you know because there were days like i could barely could match that speed but i had to go to speed and to go even beyond to win that race and um so it's 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 a lot of things it's like a puzzle and everything need to collect mm. into each other and and fit you know man that must be a crazy good feeling to know like let's say you're 15 minutes into a moto and then you've got geysers in front of you and you're having to ride at 110 percent just to stick with him but then you end up riding at 110% and then some, and then you pass him and then you win the moto. That And then to the outside, it would look to me like you've always were going to win that moto. But inside of you, you're sitting there thinking, I have to absolutely take crazy risks just to stay with this guy. And then to actually end up beating him in a moto, that must be insane. Yeah, I can I can tell you an example. Like I remember in 2018, it was Argentina GP. I don't know if you have seen that second moto, but it was a very like was that you and Tony at the time? Yeah, me and Tony. And yeah, I knew this guy was fit, but I I seen him like a few days before chilling this that. And I was I went on my freaking bicycle. I got like a route near my house, which is like 35 k's, which is like I don't know 25 miles or something. And I would fucking push the shit out of my on my road bike, just to, <laughs> like hard beat like through the roof. And I, I knew, so I, I was like minus 10 seconds with like six minutes to go plus two left. So I was like, all right, I got 10 minutes. And I'm just, go, I, I jumped over the finish line and I saw him in the back. I'm like, I'm going to fucking eat you alive, brother. I'm going to fucking eat you alive. And then I just, I just kept close it because I knew like when I, then I just remember at the times, like when it's so tough, like when I can barely hang on, like then I remember the times like, like you were on the boat, but I was on a freaking road bike or running or whatever i was doing i'm like i'm gonna get you so then i just went like like i went 110 percent and beyond probably so and then i just knew like i'm physically super super strong and then i just i just kept nailing them down and, and i passed them on the last lap i did it often that i really had those last mo uh, late moto charges and it also gives you mental rest because then you know like halfway the moto okay when it comes up to the last three four laps i got that speed i got that desire and mainly I got that fitness to still, you know, pull the trigger when I have to. Because especially in 2018, Tony, he would damn always hold shot. You know, he was the Jorge Prado from today, you know. And I would always come from the middle of the pack. And then he always had a big gap. And then I had to nail him down, close him down and to, to make it work. But then, yeah, I, I knew I was physically so, so strong. Because I would, I, I, I did a bit of training with Elden. But I was even putting in more work, I believe, because I did like basically three, four trainings a day. I would wake up, get on that road cycle at like 7.30 in the morning till like 9, come back, go riding from like 11 till 2, come back, um, do some swimming training after, do some even core stability, gym. I would literally wake up at 7 and, and start from training at 7 in the morning till like 5 in the evening and then do that every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday. I had to travel on Friday so I could just train a bit. But then... I was tired at times. I was like super lean because I would, I would just train all day. But then I knew when it would come up to the last 10 minutes and especially when it was hot, I knew nobody would have anything for me at that time. So it, um, yeah, that was, that was good. And also last year, um, often, you know, on, 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 on the end, you know, I think in 2018, I was really, really strict. Like I would train so much last year, I did a bit less. Um, but I knew I was always really strong on, on the end of the, on the end of the races let's say yeah that's so sick dude it, it must just be so cool <laughs> to like the big dick energy that must be flowing when you get back in the truck especially you beat your teammate you know like and not yeah. not want to beat him like in a bad way uh, but to to walk into that truck 
big dick energy. You just you just buried both your teammates, and you know to live in that moment, it must be a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, but like beating Antonio Caroli in twenty eighteen is like beating Ricky Carmichael or James Stewart in their prime, you know, because he was still on his prime. So to beat the yeah. legendary Antonio Caroli, which has been dominating for the last decade in Europe, that was because nobody really ever could have beat him when he was healthy you know like, like he's been winning champions from, from 20 2009 till 2017 he won every single one besides two when he got injured so in 2015 and 16 he got injured so nobody really could have beat him so it was the first time be, and i wanted to beat him when he was still on his all-time high because after that you know he got 33 34 30, he's like 36 by now but so it's four or five years ago he was like still 32 33 so he was still on his on his prime so i wanted to beat the dude on his prime and not many people can say that they beat it Caroli on his prime on a regular base, you know. For sure, he had races where Clement de Salle beat him and this guy beat him, but never really for a championship. So it was really cool to... And also last year when, when there was finally a year when everybody was healthy, Favre was there all year, Geis was there all year. I I even missed three motos due to... I don't know, the Italian dude jumped on my on my back. can't remember his name, but... Um, oh, that was And then gnarly. I missed like three motos. Yeah, you saw that one. So yeah, yeah, he was on a cow. He jumped. Ah, oh, Monty Sally, that was his name. So he jumped. He jumped on my back, and um, yeah. So even on on a year like that, with Caroli being there every single weekend, and Prado to really, it was a five way championship, and to have won that, that that also means much because normally you never have a season like like for example this season, I'm not there. Renault was injured. Favre was injured. Uh, Prado missed a race. So basically, you know, it got handed to Caroli's guys because he's the only one who. Yeah, Caroli is, is retired, the Sal is retired, Polan is retired. So basically, Geis is the only one who's been doing every single race till now. So it's basically just they hand out the championship to him. But still, I think right now from the current riders who are there, he's still the fastest and the best. But um, last year, there was really truly everyone at every single race. So to win it then, it's it's more special than winning a championship, for example, this year. Because then they will always say, oh, you won that championship because Fev was injured. Oh, you won that championship because Hurlings wasn't there. So um yeah, to win it last year when everyone's there was, was 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 nice. So when you like, you want to talk about that road bike ride where you just want to go out and absolutely destroy yourself. What are you the kind of guy that's just pumping yourself up the whole time? You're in your head, just basically like talking shit on yourself to make yourself go uh, faster and harder. And or are you very? zen like do you go into a zone where you don't have thoughts and you stop talking to yourself and you just get in the zone and just bash it out what kind of guy are you like that i'm the first guy man i'm like pumping myself like gotta win on the weekend gotta win on the weekend and then that's uh, sure you know i don't follow much people i know exactly what they're doing man i know everything like i just mentioned the year like about the u.s races here but i know exactly what's happening i know exactly what they're doing I got my eyes everywhere, my man. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I knew. I, uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, I'm just pulling myself up like, and then I, I just get pissed off. I see those guys being on a boat or doing, eating burgers. And I'm like, I can't even, if I look at that burger, I'm getting two kilos. So I need a, I need a salad. I need carrots. I need, I, I'm like a bunny, you know what I mean? So I need to really <laughs> look at everything I really do. And then it just, I'm like, I'm going to go out. I'm like, you know and then but then like three times a day you know and then it's 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 mentally tough so i remember 2018 when 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 i really did it the Eldon baker kind of program 2.0 and maybe even more extreme like when that season was done after like nine months of it i was cooked like i just laid in the sofa yeah. for a month to really recover from that but <laughs> if you look at that year i won set um i i broke my collarbone so i missed one race i was out for like 10 days or something but um I, I won 17 out of the 19 races. I got twice second. So I, to have a season where you basically are on a podium every single round and you win 17 out of 19 out of them, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's that's not gangster. happened much, you know? That's <laughs> yeah. gangster stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's like Everts, Caroli, you, basically. Like maybe not I don't even, I don't even think they've, I, I think just Everts had it. But I think I don't even know if there's ever been a rider who won more than 17 MXGPs in, in, in one year. I don't know if it's ever someone have done it. But um, yeah, that's just Everest kind of style. But truly, at, at when Everest was racing, I don't want to be cocky right now, but I don't believe the competition was as high as it's been the last mm. decade, let's say. Because at that time, it, it's like Ricky's time. You know, Ricky was racing and then it was no one coming like, for a while until then. 
then Chad and, and, and James were there and then it got more and more but like at, at some years when Ricky was racing like in O2 in for example when Jeremy just kind of retired yeah. and didn't race much it was just Ricky and it was Ricky and and like Tortelli and, and had a couple good it, motos yeah but then it was Stefan and it was Stefan because then Tortelli mm. dislocated his hip in, 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 in Portugal I remember so it was just it was just Stefan, you know, and then Josh Coppins, I probably you know this Kiwi. Yeah. He he yeah, popped up his shoulder or something, so he uh, he didn't race all year basically, and then he when he came back he beat at Stefan for uh, in in Ireland or something I believe, but um, yeah yeah it's been uh, yeah I think the competition nowadays are stronger as well as in the US as yeah. in Europe the field is more stacked than it was back in in those days. Yeah, I completely agree, man. And uh, it, talking about the Tommy Searle podcast again, um, we were talking about the Euro GOAT and we were kind of going back and forwards between Caroli and Everts. I mean, you might have an opinion. Like, wh- is Caroli the Euro GOAT for, for you? Or, I mean, are you, even, are you the Euro GOAT for you? Like, who's the <laughs> Euro GOAT? For me, Caroli, even though he didn't, he just, he, I think he got 94 GP wins while Stefan has 101 and uh, 10 against nine championships. But the guys Caroli had to face or the guys Stefan had to face, to me, Caroli's guys were more rough, like more tough. Like he had to face so many heavy hitters like Porcel with the beginning. Uh, he had to face me, he had to face... Uh, okay, he had some easy years. Like, I believe this 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. Those years were pretty easily. He just rushed racing. Was that when he was on the 350? Salvage. Yeah, when he was on the 350. Um, at that time, I believe it was his most easy years. But still, he had to face some, some, some tough guys. And I truly believe he's been maybe a more complete, better rider. Because at the time Stefan was racing, he could just do two classes in one day i don't know if you remember the day he was mm, in france he won like yeah. three he did like a 250 450 and 650 so he won like three races yeah. on one day yeah we we cannot do six motos on one day you know what i mean so uh there's not, there's only two classes by now and and um yeah so things have changed throughout the years and i believe tony is a little bit better but at the same time you know stefan has been great he he he's done uh, and achieved great things in the sport and um but yeah, once again, I think Tony is is an inch better. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that was probably um, that was I think that was pretty much Tommy's argument as well. Is just so much competition and through errors, you know, so many bike changes and so many the way that you know the tracks. Like, well, I guess the tracks were the same in Europe, but there was just a really big progress over those years. But then I look at videos of Steph and Ride. And he's doing the foot on the pegs, the on your toes, like the way that he was riding a bike was, he was riding the modern technique just a lot slower because the competition wasn't pushing him forwards, you know? Yeah, true. And I, I believe the bikes got so much better. Like when Stefan was racing, it's been 16 oh, years ago. Those bikes would have been so, so shit. <laughs> those yummy like it's been that was like uh you know army tank you know the bikes uh, back yeah. in the day and, yeah. and right now it, uh, things have developed so much and have changed so much so it's hard like um to really compete with each other but uh yeah you know uh, like tommy also mentioned like 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 in the eras tony's been racing a lot of guys been coming and going coming and going but also Stefan did great things he even beat above at his prime and medley that that, that yeah. nations yeah um so the way he passed baba around the outside was you know baba was 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 the guy um i don't think baba really liked that track you know it wasn't really american kind of track at that day okay there was a lot of <laughs> jumps but the lines and the rods and yeah he didn't enjoy his time there i believe but um yeah i believe ricky he beat it stefan every time out basically um i remember that time of foxhole when stefan won but that was like big mud fest but like the last times when it was in zola 2003 and na 2005 he always had the better of, of of stefan so i believe in the era of let's say 1998 and and 2006 i think ricky has been the fastest guy at that time worldwide um but um yeah i think if you ask me who has been even a better rider, Ricky or, or, or Stefan, I would, I would say from that era, Ricky, cause he was, 
it was so fun to look at like like Stefan was really yeah. boring standing up feet on the back nothing when he would jump he would go like rah, like old school sky high <laughs> while Ricky was like on it uh risky trolling and bike like sideways opening and and really aggressive riding style so I believe Ricky yeah he was that guy from that era you know yeah that's cool man uh so i want to go back to the the mindset stuff um because i just i you've got like from just meeting you in 2013 or whatever it was i just it it left an impression of me and just in terms of like i don't want this to come across the wrong way but like your ego like you've got a fucking gnarly ego and everyone has an ego so it's not like i'm not saying like you're the only person that has an ego we all do you have a gnarly fucking ego and you're just down to just you want to win and you're down to do what it takes and there's a certain level of confidence like to wake up every day and be jeffrey hurlings would be gnarly like you've got to get up like you said you're doing these five or you know like seven hour training sessions basically you're risking your life going insane speeds on some of the roughest motocross tracks in the world you're riding more than anybody else so just to be you, you've got to be very different. And I think as a part of that comes this like ego that you've got and this persona that you've got. What do you even think about it much? Or is it you're just you and you're just doing what you think you've got to do to be the best guy in the world? Yeah, like I got a different mindset than many of them. I'm, I'm different in many different ways. Like me... I don't enjoy going to a race on Thursday. I don't enjoy hanging around. I don't enjoy doing interviews. I don't enjoy doing photo shoots. I'm just going there with one thing. I want to freaking win. I'm here to win. I'm not here to be the cool guy. I'm not here to be the friendly guy. I'm just here to do my thing, go home, and come back next week and do the same thing over again. Which is for a brand. I've changed. I've changed. (laughs) Mainly get the win, you know? That's that's, that's even more important. (laughs) At at the same time, you know, for a brand, it's not always been the best, you know? Because... Um, a lot of guys got good rides and good paychecks just because they've been not the top guy because they were just running around fifth but they've been a good ambassador and that's I think throughout the years I've changed but especially at the beginning I was just a cocky dick man like when I was like in 2012 or 2013 I was winning but nobody really wanted to work with me because I was not really speaking to anyone pretty arrogant and I've changed throughout the years I got way different Um, and yeah you know uh, everybody has his own way of handling things and but still you know i always say the monkey never changed so for sure i I do the other parts but at the same time i'm just here to win you know i i don't like all the things coming around i just like to win and train and do whatever i need to do to achieve my goal and i don't really like the side projects you know i i just want to do what i need to do to win and that that stays me and um I've been very thankful with KTM because they really basically throughout the years, I've been there since 2009. So it's been uh, 13 years and they basically just give me the freedom to do whatever I want to yeah. do. If I wanted to go train there or I want to do any races besides GPs, I could do basically whatever I want to do. So they've been very open and very supportive and they've been really good to me in, in whatever decision I've made. And they've been in tough and bad and good times with me. Like we've won a lot of championships together, but we also had a lot of issues together in a way of, what I did, like, I don't know if you remember that time when I um, started shouting in front of live TV in 2012, I think, in Portugal, when, when, oh, when, when, when do, Tommy yeah. Searle, his, 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 his buddy Mel Paycock, his, his buddy Mel <laughs> Paycock, like, I last lap, and he, it was like a, there was a big rot, and he just stands still, and I fucking, he, uh, Tommy passed me on the outside, and, and, yeah, I made some big chaos, and, and, and the week before, I, I was with um, um, Hunter Lawrence's current girlfriend, I believe, uh, at that time, yeah. so which is like 10 years ago by now. And I cleaned out her brother. So which actually my brother-in-law at the time. <laughs> so I, I freaking cleaned the shit out of this guy. He was uh, out of the track. Uh, <laughs> so a big fight there. So, um, yeah, and for all of that, like, Katie always had my back. So they, you know, we've been in a lot of good and bad times together. And um, luckily, I made the results work often. That's been my luck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got some good stories, yeah. And that's the thing, like, and I guess I've always looked at this through a different lens because I just met you and that it was that, you know, kind of had that experience of that weekend. So, like, I could see that you're a cool, nice guy, 
but you were just one track mind obsessed with winning and you were going to do whatever it took to win no matter what and it's like you just kind of have to accept if that's what a guy's there for then that's what he's there for and i'm really good friends with casey stoner and that was him in moto gp and he got a lot of the same criticisms that you know like he didn't like to do interviews he didn't want to talk to media and people called him this and that but they just didn't understand him and him as a person like even now he's not stoked to be taking pictures with people he's not that's just not his personality and i think a lot of times especially when you're in a sport uh in a sporting environment and you're a public figure and people look up to you and you've got these endorsement deals the sport wants you to be this darling champion and they want you to be this perfect guy but man some people it just doesn't line up with who they are and uh and i just think that you're one of those guys and to me it's almost a shame because I think you've got a lot of shit for it in a way. And that's probably why you don't do interviews. It's probably why you're closed off. Like it's, that's, there's two things that are happening there. And, uh, and I think that we've probably lost a lot of good years of listening to like you be a cool, funny guy just because of all that. Yeah, true. And I, I'm, I'm right now in a position, I cannot say anything, but oh, a lot of things, but what, after my career, I definitely want to do an open interview at one day and, and speak about all the, things what have happened you know like i said once again i don't really want to get into this deeply now because like i'm an endorsed for yeah. many companies for a long time and i can't really say much but after my career though i would really do like a kind of an open book to really say everything has been happening for the last 15 years from from left to right from up to down so but um i think you know for a brand like to have a like like tony and uh from europe and and, and ryan dungy from the us they were like the perfect ambassadors they were always friendly always good always working on the on the interviews they were there like one day front doing all those media sessions things like that so actually for a brand those were the perfect guys you know um never any criticism never any, any criticism about the manufacturer they were racing for and yeah then you had some other guys like like for example baba you know he was one time in police because i don't know with that thing on a on a scar and so that gave yeah, him a yeah, bit yeah. of bad publicity which i i reckon is super funny but you know Same. for a brand <laughs> it's like 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 it's not good to have your rider barely out of custody or whatever he was in for and then just have him race. Yeah. i don't know if you remember that story in 2011 yeah, but, i do yeah, so, yeah, yeah and 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 um yeah so but that, that also makes it interesting you know um yeah and and okay like then you talk about a guy like jason lawrence he was next level man i've i've read an article about him like recently i think that's a bit too much maybe but yeah that that's also like they have some badass figures in the sport that's also been nice hey do you want to take a quick jason lawrence sidebar yeah we can <laughs> all right so he dm'd me the other day i haven't i haven't spoke about it publicly he DM'd me and said, you can spread the word that I will be racing a national this year on a gas gas sponsored by Armour Energy. I need to Honestly, just, I'll really? pull up the DM. Bro, seriously, I'll, I'll just double check. <laughs> I, I want to get, I want to get my facts right. He told me that I can, uh, <laughs> that I can say this and I just completely <laughs> forgot about it up until now. All right. Um, all right. All right. I'll read this word for word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let it brew for a few days so I can iron out the details, and then after the um, after the after I agree to the terms, I'll tip you off again. I'm pretty sure Gas Gas 450, Armor, and Pro Taper sponsored under TLD team. At this time, Sapovic will be making a little news release which will validate Gypsy Tales claims. Boom! Can you imagine Ooh. watching? Jason Lawrence at one round of the Nationals this year on a Gas Gas 450. That's amazing, man. Like, I, I, I watched a video, some, also some American dude, like, had said, like, um, maybe you know who, who uh, published it. It was like, he did, like, the, the 10 riders who really oh. wasted their careers due to bullshit. I don't I know who made it, it. But Is it good? So, Is it good? That, well, that, then at one point, there was Jason Lawrence coming through, and then I think it was on his video, and they were saying, like, Oh yeah, he got to jail for this, and then he smoked 
weed or cocaine cocaine or whatever he did i don't i can even i don't know if i, I say it exactly right but that all the shit he'd been going through and then he had the problem with the team and then he was in jail and he wasn't this and he wasn't that so i was like i was looking at you i was like oh my god this this dude is fucking insane so i really enjoyed i enjoyed watching him and then i see when he when he fight it with villapoto like hang down off camera he just <laughs> launched his bike or i think villapoto launched his bike to him they were start, yeah. started like fighting and, and, and shit like that so that was actually really funny <laughs> to watch and, and and what he said sometime in his post race interview and he and the way he was talking like he was yeah it's just insane <laughs> yeah dude he, he's the man i i actually t i talked to him a little bit i um i like sponsored him some um i sent him some cash to get to day in the dirt and stuff i just i like the guy i think he's fucking cool and uh i, I believe think that i believe yeah no 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 go uh, i i believe ryan dungey already starts sweating man when he knows he's gonna be on the gate ryan dungey starts sweating <laughs> yeah dude so I, I i think that that's probably what inspired him a little bit to maybe try like i know he's all, he rides all the time like he just rides every day and uh he just lives up at this sand track in uh in like new fucking wherever that he lives and uh he just rides sand like all day every day and he still you know loves bikes and he still super follows the sport but i mean he's probably the most extreme example like kind of what i'm talking to you about in, in the way that the sport has probably given you a little bit of shit over the years for like the way that you deal with the media and the way that you deal with stuff but in my mind well jason lawrence is probably the most extreme example of it but i'm like i've always enjoyed the dumb shit that you do like it gives me something to talk about it gives me something to think of like you know and i know that you're just you're just this wild dude that only gives a fuck about winning and you're just crazy and you're just gonna do whatever that you've like you've got to be crazy to do what you do and then to expect you not to be crazy seems crazy <laughs> Yeah, I, I hopefully my reputation isn't as bad as G Lawrence's reputation, but it's you not. got more of those guys. Like you see, you see, you see with Christopher Purcell, like he was so talented. Like to me, Kenny Roxon is talented, Jorge Prado is talented, but Christopher Purcell, next level shit, bro. I saw him right once in the south of France, dude. This dude, insane. Like I think when he goes to the top, he even shit out talent, man. He's he's so he's so <laughs> so talented. So he like um same with his brother actually because I, I did a bit of writing and started front mm. of him but like same with them like they had so much talent and barely at any championships you know what i mean so um but i, I don't think he fucked up as bad as <laughs> as g law has <laughs> yeah i mean dude how sick would it be to see him ride a 450 like that's just don't put the camera on anyone else for a whole round. Just film him. Let's all just let's all just watch him because that dude rips. He's got the coolest style. Like, remember the last time he just showed up and raced? What was it? What year was it? A I Daytona. Think it was Daytona. And he almost I think Daytona. And then yeah, one. Oh wait, one. But then he did. He got nah, second. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah, oh eight or oh nine. Then he wasn't that uh, amp mobile white yeah, yeah. black monster yeah. uh, yamaha i think yeah it was pretty naughty i haven't i haven't seen him ever since i think he, i don't know where, 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 where he's been to but he's i haven't i haven't seen him since but by now i think he what age is he like 25 or something 33 no nah, he's dungy's age oh he's dungy's age yeah so maybe like 32, bro. 33 probably oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah he's coming he's coming out of retirement unfinished business he's got Dunge. he's got time he's got yeah. time <laughs> yeah probably oh <laughs> uh, that's so good um yeah so i mean i guess that yeah that that's kind of one thing that uh, it's one thing that i guess i try and do a little bit differently like i don't ever want to criticize guys for mistakes that they made and the way that they dealt with this after race or the way that they did this because it's to go through yeah and i think the same about mma fighters like it's not an excuse for shit behavior but i think sometimes we just expect every single rider to never have a bad day, like to always be Dungy or to always be Corolla. That's just not real life. And I almost don't want to see that. And look, as amazing as a champion as Dungy is, there's so many people that would thought he was boring at a time because he never fucking did anything wrong, you know? And, and to the average person, like I fuck up all the time in my life. I'm not perfect in any way, shape or form. 
So it's like, I can't relate to that dude that just never says anything wrong. And never like, to me, I think, well, I think that's why people call it boring. Cause it's like, that's not real, bro. Like I fuck up all the time. No, and I, <clears throat> I believe you need a guy like Jason Lawrence. I mean, for yeah. me, it's going to be pretty harsh what I'm going to tell you. But for me, Justin Barsha is worse because he doesn't make that stupid things in, in the press. He's not on cocaine or whatever that Jason Lawrence is on. But he <laughs> cleans the shit out of people. So I prefer some, some dude being a little bit dodgy and laugh, but he's not been cleaning up people, you know. Like like I saw some passes what, what Justin has done to, to Malcolm and, and that he you would just went for the jaguar man like i think that's 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 not okay like i respect him like i love his, his style and i love the way he is how aggressive he is and stuff but from a writer's point of view like the injuries are s like just waiting there uh because our spot yeah. is so dangerous then to do that like it's just like if you just want to block someone f fair and square no problem but like sometimes cleaning out people that's pretty mm, I, I don't know like I, I, I don't mm. know but he, he's not crying when somebody does it back to him so that's a good thing like when they clean Justin out he's like alright fine doesn't matter so that's mm. what I respect a lot about him but like for me a guy like Jason Lawrence is, is, is good even for the sport at times I believe because it, uh, it it has also a bad reputation 100% but at the same time when you have a guy like Ryan Dungey which is so uh, so great to be honest because he doesn't say a thing wrong not about mm. anything is like you said, maybe a bit boring at times because he's just like the perfect son-in-law kind of yeah. thing. You know what I mean? While, yeah. while, yeah, he just knows is the opposite side and maybe a little bit too extreme. But if some sometimes somebody does something not right, like in the MMA kind of fights and say some bullshit here and then, I think it's not not a bad thing because if not, everything just gets so boring. You know, every like, yeah, I want to thank this, want to thank this, blah, 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 blah. It was a great day. Bye. See you next weekend. You know, that's pretty boring as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, no, nah, definitely, man. And when it, when it comes to uh, like, we sort of spoke a little bit about it, but it comes to, you know, like not doing interviews and stuff like that. Is it just because you just don't want to deal with the bullshit? Like, is that pretty much what it breaks down to in a guy like your position? Well, often it's about injuries to me. Like, they just want to speak about yeah you want you didn't win the championship because of your injury yeah i know like i, I didn't mm. i didn't want to crash my brain out because i love doing it i don't like breaking bones because <laughs> i love doing it so they just want to talk about injuries and the injuries and you didn't win because of the injury i'm like i don't even want to do an interview with you like it doesn't bring me any like i love this interview to be honest like i love it because we haven't spoken about injuries basically so it doesn't matter like in this sport you know injuries are involved like the, from every top guy had injuries some had a bit more than others that's the way it is and but you're like really motocross related and you ask good questions and that's why i probably love people like to be in your show because you you have a lot of good questions and um you don't ask dumb questions like like hey what do you exactly make for money because you know you will never get that answer because <laughs> you've been in this industry long enough but you got some dumb journalists asking you this question like ah oh, what's the bonus if you win a race none of your business you will never get an answer and that then when you want to do interviews with those guys you don't want to do them, you know? And then especially if you want to, they mm. want to just want to talk about injuries and the, the mistakes you've made, you know, like this is just an open interview, like what me and you are having and you will, cause you're so much knowledge about the sport. You will not ask those dumb questions probably. So, um, yeah, that's just, that's just a fun thing. Like why we could have such a good interview. Well, with others, you sometimes just don't want to do the interview cause they ask dumb questions and they don't know anything mm. about the sport kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 and I, I feel like uh, it's just a bummer. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. I wasn't looking for, <laughs> I wasn't looking for uh, for that. But um, but yeah, I mean, it just to me, it's a bummer because it's like when you kind of, I feel like everyone's like you in a way, you know, like everyone, everyone's different. But in terms of, I guess, the sport and being an athlete, like there's just this whole other side, and you know, I feel like there's so many guys that um you know you've kind of missed seeing their personality a little bit like i mean i'm sure people are going to see this and just be like it's probably what you saw in ando a little bit you know like you you see an interview and you're like damn he's like the coolest guy and you know there's so much that it kind of stays behind this curtain because you know you go into your race weekend and you know exactly what people are going to say you, it's the same drill the same questions the same everything like you kind of can just build a wall up that doesn't show exactly who you are. And I think that 
the more that you put yourself out there, then the more room you leave for people to talk about you in a kind of negative way. And then I guess that just creates more distractions. And so it's like, I can see why guys like you just never do interviews. And when you do, it's like really basic. But to me, it seems like such a bummer to almost have like, most of your career go past and people really don't understand that you're actually just like a fucking legend like the rest of us you know <laughs> no exactly and often you got all those appointments on race day or the day before you know and then you're like you don't even want to do them like for, for me like when you want to do it you, you just because of the team they they uh, oblige you to basically do the interviews because it's publicity for the team which is really good and it, it's normal it they makes want sense, you to do some yeah. interviews but they it makes sense for them you know because sure they need advertisement and, and that's just not only for KD and that's for all the manufacturers probably so you just give them like the answer they want like hey uh what are your predictions for the week yeah i want to win okay next question next question yeah. but like this yeah. it, it just it's just like there's a time and a place for everything like now i'm injured and then you just have a, like an open conversation with a guy like you who really knows all the ins and outs about the sport which have nice questions and there's time and places for doing it and for example like you don't want to do this interview, for example, on on uh, on a yeah, Friday night before season. a race, you know, because yeah, then you're super, yeah, super yeah. busy and, and things like that. But on a time like now, plus you ask, like, once again, really good questions, like, and interesting ones. Like, same with Jason when he talked about Eldon and his move from Kawi to, to, to Husqvarna. You have so many good questions, which are also for the people who are watching the show. It's very interesting because they don't know those things. And people who are mm. not in the sport, they will never have the knowledge like you to ask those smart questions you know like those are questions people want to know like how does that go and why did that happen and things like that so but that once again comes back to you being um yeah so passionate about the sport and knowing so many ins and outs you know what i mean oh well no i appreciate that bro hey when you when you said uh you, you talk about ktm uh, and it's not like this is just not a KTM thing. This is just every team, every motorsport, every sport. Every, like, So the team is over on this side and they're trying to maximize. Like you're an investment to the team, basically. Like they've invested money in you and then they expect a return on investment, basically, right? And part of that yeah. return on investment is, okay, we need media, we need socials, we need photo shoots, we need this, we need that. And then there's the rider, which is on the other side of the coin, and then they're like, okay, well, A, you're paying me to win. And then B, you, you're requesting all of this media and all of these interviews. And it might be with, there's maybe a dickhead journalist that you don't like that you are forced to talk to because he's the main guy. I mean, there's definitely that in other countries. And it's like, there's a balance then between like, you've got to give a little bit and then, you know, they've got to give a little bit. And Dude, it's so common right now. Like, I mean, I was just at the F1 um, in Barcelona and it was just like, I got to see firsthand the requirements on an F1 driver. It blew my fucking mind. Like, and I've been around a ton of races. I could not believe. Like, how do you even get in a car and do that shit when 20 minutes before, like, you've got 20 cameras in your face? Like, it's a it's a crazy kind of level and i think that it's probably happening in a way because social media is still very new and there's all these new ways that teams are trying to maximize and i think we're just in this crazy wild wild west time of like i guess what i'm trying to say is i think this time right now is probably the most a rider will ever get asked of them because i think at times I think it has to scale back a little bit. I think the teams maybe have to ask a little bit less of riders on the day or make it more direct and more focused and more controlled in a way because it seems like it's just way too much at times. 100%. 100%. Like, like I think with Formula 1, it's even next level shit. Like, there's so much going on. It's it's all about their social media, you know? Uh, yeah. But it's 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 broadcasted worldwide. So many TV channels. I, I know, I, I've seen it from close by. It's really, really way worse than a motocross. But even now, I remember lining up 12 years ago at a GP. They, wouldn't, they barely had an iPhone. You would just come up, do your race, that's it. Yeah. Now, okay, make a social video for Alpine Star. Make one for KTM Factory Racing. Make one for this sponsor. Make one for that sponsor. While at that time, it wasn't there. So, um, mm. but this is just the world we're living in today. Like, 
like I said well, before, like they didn't have an Instagram like probably 15 years ago. Right now, there's everything. People are living off their phones. You know, when you wake up, probably you the same. You wake up on your phone. All right, first thing you're gonna check our oh, Instagram, WhatsApp, reply mm. to people. Well, things have changed. Well, I believe racing 15 years ago was way better because then you really had to pop on the TV and yeah. you could only see the races and if somebody got injured, you would know by TV because people would say, oh, this guy got injured on Wednesday in practice. Now, if somebody gets injured on Wednesday in practice, 30 minutes er after you get you open Vital MX or you open Racer X, poof, oh, um, Jason Anderson yeah. broke his big toe, you know, whatever I mean, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and then you got 300,000 people that can comment. Like, that's the yeah, other the thing, whereas warriors. when it was just on the TV, yeah, there's no keyboard warriors when it was just on the TV. Yeah, so um, re regarding uh, for, for getting sponsors, it maybe got a bit better because, yeah, you get, like, for example, for me, I can get so mm. much free shit due to Instagram. Like, some people are like, oh, for a post, <laughs> I'll give you uh, this, I'll give you that, you know, and the more followers you get, so you get a lot of free stuff and you can maybe get sponsors. Like, like I believe with Kenny with his, I don't know what he has, like 1.5 million sponsors, uh, f uh, followers. He could, like, his yeah. price just goes up just because of that. You know, he brings... Like, he gets probably 100k likes on a photo. So, for Fox and for Honda and for Red Bull, it's so much advertisement. It's also a value, you know? Like, you know, that's that's yeah. a high-value thing. Like, at the time when Ricky was racing, that wasn't an Instagram, for example. So, it was just by TV and for people coming to the to the main events and watching them ride, and that's it. So, by that, it's also... A, it's a, It has some good things and it has some bad things. So, um, just from a sportive point of view... I think it was better 15 years ago, but from a financial point of view, it's better now because due to mm. all that social media and advertisement you can bring along, the prices go up and it, it, it brings more broadcast and it just, that goes better. So what's the, what's the happy medium for you? Like, obviously, because it's not like, it's not like you're trying to say, I don't want to do any of it. it. This is all bullshit. You understand it. And you can probably see it from both sides. So, like, what do you think is the happy medium? Does it does it need to back off just a little bit, and then maybe you have a bit more control of it, or like, how have you ever thought about the way that it would work best in your mind? For me, it just gets worse and worse um, every single year because everything, the social media gets more and more important. Um, but some writers they don't really give a shit too much. Like, I follow Eli Tomac. He barely posts anything. He just posts like three days after <laughs> He's the race, biggest like, oh, G, one yeah. one. And, and then he just, put, he, he, I, I barely, he, you know, do like a photo from Oakley when it's on a sunglass on a story and that's it. And then he just posts us basically like, all right. That's Dude, big, I bet he doesn't even know. Share, you know? <laughs> I bet he doesn't yeah, even so, know his password to Instagram. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually like that, you know, and same with Cooper Webb. He doesn't post much either, but, um, but then you've got a guy like Kenny or Cairoli. When you open their Instagram, there's like 15 stories coming up, you know, like, so it's from a writer's point of view as well, like, um, because regarding results, Eli has won way more than Kenny, but because Kenny was so much on social media, he got like maybe yeah. almost double of the followers or like like half a million more, which also brings a value to Kenny. So it, it just from the writer, like, you know, one writer likes to post a lot and about his private life and whatever he's doing and when he's doing a shit and when he's having a dinner and whatsoever, while the other guy like yeah. Eli, he barely posts anything. So it just yeah just whatever as a writer you feel comfortable with and whatever you want to share with the world i think is eli the guy that you can relate to the most do you think yeah i think we're really similar like he he to me as an outsider i don't know him personally i never speak with him but from outside he just likes to do his job like he just wants to come to the race race try to win and get the fuck back to colorado wherever he lives so while <laughs> While some other guys, they really enjoy the entire thing, like coming there, traveling there with the family and kid and having a nice weekend out and do the race and fly home maybe Monday and whatsoever. While, while to me, it really seems like, like Eli's a bit like me. Train super hard, make sure you're super fit, do the race and get out. And don't, don't be in this wall media thing and, and posting all kind of things, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, just through this conversation, it really seems like Eli is a guy that you kind of see a lot of yourself in him. And I think it's cool, and from just listening to you talk, it almost seems like he's had a pretty big influence on, on you. And maybe, you know, maybe there's times where you're dominating in Europe, 
and you're the man, but you're it seems like there's always one eye over at what he's doing and you're almost comparing your career to him in a sense at times, even though you aren't racing each other and it's like different. It's, it's almost like he's the guy you judge yourself off in a way. Yeah. Cause like in 2017, he often had like pretty bad stars and then you would take whole shots or whatever. And, and he would always eat them alive on the end of the races. And I've been studying him so much and due to that in 2018, I knew, like, I was kind of same. Eli starts, his average from his career are not super. Like, Kenny starts are really good. For example, Dungey starts really good. But Eli starts, his average for the last 10 years are not great. So he would always come from middle of the pack or from fave or whatever. And then work his way to the front. Like, in the second part of the moto, pass them, check out, win. So I've been really studying him a lot. And I think um, that was also my goal for 2018, for example, to really come in there and I knew my stars weren't as good as Carolis because he's like 10 or 15 kilo less. He's a better starter than I am. And and I really try to be a little bit like Eli. And to me, I love him because he's just like, I like it. Like not putting all that freaking shit on social media. Just come out, do your thing, make sure you win. Yeah. And I'll try to win and go home and not like all the glitter and glamour. I don't, I don't like that shit. Man, there's a, it's a story I've told on here a couple of times, but he's the only rider that I've ever filmed. You were little when we filmed. You're only <laughs> 19 on a lights bike. But I remember Eli Tomac at Millville coming down. You know the hill, the last big downhill that you come down and then you go right yeah. and then you go left and then you've got the jumps and then you're going up the hill. Jumps, yeah. Dude, he come, yeah. he come down that last hill and I thought he was going to hit me. That's like I felt the ground moving. And I thought that he'd <laughs> gone off the track and was going to hit me. Nope. That was just him breaking. I could feel the dude coming. Like, that's how fucking gnarly <laughs> this guy is on the track. And that just always just never left me, dude. I saw him in um, Kegums 2014. It was a motocross of nations. It was him, Jeremy Martin, and I think it was Barsha. I'm not, I'm not sure who was the third guy. But then he was like, there had a lot of those outside turns and actually i'm not sure you should ask him one day when you see him but i believe he crashed all three the motors with a start like every single time he had a start he crashed qualifying race and the both motos i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm 99 percent sure it happened so then they had like a few outside turns and i, I believe paulin he, he was on a kawi still monster kawi and he won he went a one one there but tomac dude they had some outside like outside berms I swear to God, the berm just got scared when Tomac came in. He <laughs> hit that berm so extremely hard. That freaking berm just moved a meter every time he went. Every time he went through like, like insane <coughs> speed, and he went so fast. Like exactly like in 2015, like when he crashed and he popped up both both shoulders in Colorado. I think he just was too fast. Like his speed yeah. was so ridiculous. It just it just was just waiting for it to go wrong because he was just faster than the freaking bike and the track could handle him going. You know, like insane. Dude, I've seen that same shit in you, though. There's been times where I've been watching you ride <laughs> and, and just on, on the TV. I mean, again, shout out to Tom Genet, but when his last Euro trip video that he did, like, I, I actually made a social clip out of it. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's when me and Tom are doing the podcast and we we're talking about you riding. There's this, it's like maybe first lap or second lap, you've got the start and then you come over... I, Maybe it's like the Finnish tabletop. I don't know Euro tracks that good. But you come down and then there's like this little single roller on the inside. And it's loamy. It's not full sand. And you just jump into this this just piece of shit. Like there's nothing there. It's just like this big <laughs> clump of shit. And you are just fucking wide open. And you just watch the all the dirt just explode it explodes off your front wheel it explodes off your rear wheel and you've just come from like third to first and you're just looking going like what the fuck is he up to like how is this okay like what what math is he doing in his brain that makes him think that's gonna work with 40 dudes behind you yeah but i believe i don't know if you've seen that race a month of it was like a make or break because i i really i don't know if, i don't know if you really followed the last race of the mgp championship last year Oh, I, I struggled to. I tried to, but I didn't do that good a job. Oh, but, like, we really, uh, like, that was, like, with three races to go, I was leading by, like, one moto, and then I had a star crash, and they rode over my handlebar, so my handlebar broke, or something with the handlebar. So, it was equal points, so we left, um, uh, we had, like, 
triple race because of the corona restrictions and then we had to the last two races and um it was like make or break because i didn't win a championship for two years straight and at one point we <laughs> went there to montova which was the last two races and uh we were equal kind of equal points me geyser and Faber. and yeah yeah that was that was insane but then actually tom coming back to your question like he made some insane shots there because he was there at that race and um yeah. Yeah, that was insane. Like going, we we went into the last moto with equal points, man. We had freaking forty motos, and we still had to go into the last moto with equal points with Favre. That was insane. <laughs> yeah, man, that's crazy, dude. I want to see, I want to see a film collab. So there's a couple things I want to see that come out of this podcast when we're all done, right? I want to see right. you and Eli Tomac texting each other. I w- I would just love to <laughs> see you two talk because you two are just cut from the same cloth. You're the Euro version of him. He's the American version of you. So you two need to connect if you've never spoken. And then the other thing that we need to see is we need a team fried and you and Rick collab. That would be some <laughs> like the shots of Tom that Tom would get of you and Rick would get of you. And if we could throw Ando in that mix, I think that would be, if that can happen from this podcast, I reckon that'd be pretty dope. Because yeah, that would be some good filmer writer chemistry. I want you to set up. I want you to set up a straight up battle war. Me and Eli on a sand track, because I he's he's always oh. winning South Rig, right? I, w- I want to yeah. do it. I want to race him one to one, thirty minute moto on a oh. sand track. If you know him, you Dude, have to set we, it up. I want to race him. We ha- race him. We but have to do that. Two gates. When two gates up. It? Me against him. Uh, when I'm right, fit. And how long? Yeah, and, and, and the, I need a bit the, of time, but <laughs> yeah, but he's still racing next year too, right? Like. Even if it's going to be next year, but one day I want to race him one to one, no one else on the track, just me against him, man to man. Oh, all right, bro. Okay, let's ta- let's let's seriously work this out. I actually think that this can happen. Because you, so. you always got that shit. Who's faster? Like, you always got that shit. Is it Herlings? No, nah, it's Tomek. No, nah, Tomek will beat Herlings. No, nah, Herlings will beat Tomek. All right, let's fix it. We go to even the Southwick. We'll do, we, we rent the track on a Monday, leave the track rough as fuck. Me against him. <laughs> man, Dude, man, man to man war. I am, who, who wins I'm that thing? So who wins that thing? <laughs> I, w- I would let, do that. All right, so, anytime. All right, when I'm healthy. So I'm let's, not healthy let's, right now. But when I get healthy, we'll do it. All right. So let's let's actually fully set this up. Let's make this like an official thing right here. All right. How I think that I could get some money for this too. I think I should. I could get like a hundred <laughs> grand. I'm not. Wait. I'm not joking. I'll get... I want to try and get a hundred thousand dollars, winner take all, right? <laughs> and then we do it. Would you, so? Would you do it at Southwick, like maybe the day after the national? Like get it watered, like not prepped, just watered, and prep the start straight, and then go. Uh, so what? Wherever, so what do wherever. we think? Uh, yeah, but like the thing, but then they will say again, our oh, hurlings won because it's a sand track, because he's the king of the sand. So actually, we need no, maybe, no, no. maybe need two, two. I don't know. I don't know, like no, no. I've, I don't know. Eli like, won't back down from I the beat sand. Him. Nah, nah. I know because Eli is fast, and like he's not a pussy. He's, he's mad. Like, but we always like, like I've been reading all those when when there was a rumor I was coming to yeah to US, which actually was the plan. Mm. There was so many keyboard wars. Oh, he's gonna win. Tell me, he's gonna win. So okay, before he gets into retirement, before I get into retirement, let's do a one to face to face face off like race. Whoever wins that, straight up. Is the fastest guy, but like no other competition, right, so, just me and him. <laughs> all right. So, do you remember? Do you remember when? Uh, do you watch UFC much? Yeah, a bit. I love Conor McGregor, man. So I remember- love his his interviews, shit talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good uh so did you see when uh Jorge Masvidal and Nate Diaz did the baddest motherfucker title um probably when I see back the uh, the fight I probably know as I've seen so many but mostly I just watch because Conor McGregor because of his, <laughs> his funny yeah, comments yeah. of all the shit you're saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like you're. Pro- I feel like you're the Conor McGregor of motocross. You just don't say the shit publicly. I, 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 have, have you seen the Conor McGregor octopus walk when he comes around that that yeah. that, that uh, <laughs> boxing thing? Yeah. If one day we'll get that thing with Tomac, and it, if I win, I'll freaking walk through the paddock like this, man, like like a king. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so. So they did this title, right? It was Jorge Masvidal and Nate Diaz. And they did, it was called the BMF title. So like the baddest motherfucker. 
So I reckon we call it the fastest motherfucker title or like the fast, yeah, fastest <laughs> motherfucker, fastest man in the world. That, that would be, in, in my opinion, you versus Eli, one versus one, 35 minutes on the same track, rough as fuck, already rough, like not fresh. Like we're talking this thing's like national nah, rough. rough. There's no, yeah. there's no arguments on who is the man. I believe you. Like I, I believe that's the or like because if you would do a race like a motocross of nation, okay, that's there's probably like 38 other guys on the gate. Then I'll get a whole shot. Yeah. He'll get a whole shot. I, I start 10th and then he win because I had to pass nine other riders. Then you still don't know who's the fastest guy. Like I remember in Red Bull, like I think I got first and second behind my teammate Glenn. But Eli got like I don't know. He got like I don't know even even know where he finished, but not inside the top three or top five, I believe. But he, he had like second gate picks, so it shit starts. So it wasn't a fair, it wasn't a fair race. Mm. So it like the only time we raced fair and square um, was an Ironman. Um, but yeah, then he crashed but, the first moto. Then yeah, and then he he was kind of like balls deep in a title. He had everything to yeah, lose. Yeah, so it doesn't count because it was you know that that was the most that was the biggest letdown ever because he couldn't really race you. You know what I mean? Not to say that he would have beat you. Like, you rode fucking crazy fast that day. But he's not... If he went out and raced you, that's the dumbest thing in the world that he could have ever done. No, exactly. Like, he he tried to race me in the first moto, and then he had a... Like, he had a big crash. Remember, we had, like, like a triple uphill, then straight into a ride. He jumped next to the track into a pile of sand, and he just front flipped. He crashed. There was something with his handlebar. So, second moto, I actually had a star crash, and I, I, I actually came... Pa- I yeah. flew past him and he didn't even battle me but exactly like you said it was the right thing to do he, he would have been so stupid to start fighting because I was there I had nothing to lose I was just for a one one day race like even if I would get injured didn't matter he was there fighting for championship and then the next weekend yeah then we went like to Jacksonville I got a second first he got a first third but the first moto I started like 15th and he took a whole shot mm-hmm. so yeah for sure he won and then the second moto something same happened similar and then I won. So we never really had a one-to-one. Like we started first and second and we would have had a straight up battle because then, then the year after in Red Bud, kind of same thing. Like his stars were terrible and he, 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 yeah, we never had like a one-to-one fight. So as long as he's the number one guy in the US, let's set up somewhere one day when I'm back healthy, let's set up a battle. Dude, I'm, I'm so in. It'd be... It'd be so cool to see as well where you just take everybody else out of the equation. And, I mean, have you ever done... I, I, I guess you would have never done a race like that where it's just two dudes, one gate drop, you do 35 <laughs> minutes, and then just full send. You don't have to deal with... You, you really wouldn't have to deal with Roost. You'd have the whole track to yourselves. Like, there'd be no lappers to deal... That would be the dopest shit in the world to watch. <laughs> that would break. That would break the internet. That hundred percent will, um, yeah. That, that that will be especially like uh, we just have to find the right location to to to, to do so. Uh, but we need a rough track. Like when it's a flat track, it's easy. Bower can just spin it, go yeah, faster. No, we need a super rough, rough track, and and uh, either in Europe or either in, in America. Um, and yeah, we should go head to head on uh, head to head on a yeah on a rough track and uh, see who come who comes out so uh that's a shame because i really wanted to go to us this season and i just yeah just barely couldn't make it like i was just two or three weeks too late on the bike like i could only start riding like eight of eight of may or something i believe or fifth and the race was 28th yeah. of may and I, I when i wanted to go there i didn't ride for three and a half months so i i felt like i would not be capable of doing a full 35 minute moto and matching that guy's yeah. speed and as the championship is so short like it's just a 12 race series week in week out I wouldn't have been capable of, of fighting for the championship. So that's why I eventually decided not to do it. But my long-term goal is to still ever raise a full outdoor championship, probably on the last year of my career. Um, it's my goal today. Maybe it will change in the future. Uh, further injuries or whatever may happen or uh, we'll see by then. But, you know, I, I, I felt really bad because I really wanted to do a full series in, in the U.S. Because I, I personally believe... The competition is super strong and those tracks are much better for me like the european tracks yeah. are so hard and slick and pff, not so fun to ride while the u.s tracks they all look so amazing and the way they prep the tracks they do such a great job in pro motocross so um yeah that's why also probably tony enjoys it so much because the tracks are just 
I just yeah. chocolate cake, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, obviously, because of my relationship with Rick. Shout out to Rick, coolest, uh, coolest Dutchman I know. Uh, he, you know, was sort of saying that he had some. Uh, he he was like, oh, Jeffrey might be close, and it might be happening. And I was like, oh man, as a fan of motocross. The world just needs to see you do a full season outdoors. And I mean, could you imagine if you were in this this particular season with everyone riding as good as good as they are, and then your level that you'd be bringing, you got Tony in there. I mean, it's already the cra- Jason Lawrence. <laughs> so it's like, it would just be the craziest season. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think that would have been insane, but the fans should have understand like with the reputation i've had to come out from a championship and then to come there being yeah, unfit and unhealthy yeah. it wouldn't didn't you make sense right. i would have been around i would really be around fifth place so um i had really had to be fit had that had, like minimum six weeks of practice in and i just couldn't make it and i think eventually i made the right decision to to not do it because also with the temperatures is super super hot one in europe we're not used to those highly temperatures um weekend in weekend out and then of course to make that trip happen it's not that i just had to come to the race you know i had to move for like four months to america had to get my ship packed had to do everything so it yeah. was just the the time notice was too too short to make it happen but uh hopefully one day in the future at least we we, we first have to get a one-to-one race with, with eli under the belt and after that we'll maybe consider a full championship <laughs> Dude, I, I'm honestly going to get a belt made, like a UFC championship belt. It's just going to be one of one, and it will be just the the coolest trophy at the end of it. And honestly, I reckon I could get 100 grand for the winner. <laughs> mate, let's, right, let's, let's, ahead, let's mate. make it a thing. Let's make it a thing. <laughs> it's up to you, my man. It's up to you. But before you get <laughs> everything together, we'll still take a while, so we'll still, uh, I'll still got some time to prepare. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. We're, hey, we're doing this when you're ready and when Eli's ready. This is this is gonna happen when this is like a this is like Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao right now. It's like the fight that <laughs> everyone wishes could have happened, and you're just like, no, no one's gonna be past their prime. It's just it's gotta be all the right conditions. Are you gonna be on pay per view? <laughs> hey, we might as well, dude. We might as well. All right, <laughs> hey, I'll put maybe live maybe broadcast, I put up that. Yeah, maybe I put up the hundred grand and then we sell it on pay per view, and then the boys get pay per view splits. We just do like a full boxing <laughs> boxing <laughs> expedition. Everybody freaking pay just to see this uh, this bell. Yeah, yeah. All right, sounds fun. Oh, I'm keen. Uh, so this uh, talk talking about like maybe doing the the US and then the GPs. This last GP, not this last GP, the GP before. There was all the riders came together. They basically didn't do the Saturday qualifying race. Like you're, you got to sit on the sidelines, so you, uh, you're Switzerland in this one. Uh, but what did you see from that? And I mean, it's funny. Um, I'd actually been hearing a lot of rumblings for the first time, like really serious rumblings of just how over it the GP riders are. And I've never really, like, that's not, I'm not a really deep GP guy, you know. So for me, who's not really in it to start hearing how unhappy GP dudes are, and then you have that, I guess you could call it almost a protest. I mean, what did you see as somebody fully on the outside of that situation? Me, as an athlete, um, I I would like to say many more things, but for me, that whole freaking Saturday need to be gone. You've seen... Thomas Kier Olsen, he's in freaking coma because of that qualifying heat. Now, Maxime Renault, he broke four vertebras because of that qualifying heat. Why take that extra risk on a Saturday? It means for nothing. You know, just do like, like even like in America, great. Just come down in the morning, do a practice, qualifying, two motors, get out of there. Where's it all Saturday for? It's just, for me, it's a wasting day. Um, especially as an athlete's kind of view, or even make a time practice like, yeah, so many guys like either like having a bike issue or having a small crash or whatever, and then they 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 kind of mess up their whole s- Sunday races because um, they have like last gate pick or almost like like in US the, the stars are pretty fair. You know, you can take a good start from basically mm. anywhere, but like in US, like if you seen last weekend, they they put the gate like this and the first turn there. So if you're not on the inside gate pick or it, within the top five inside gate picks, 
you'll have a pretty bad start. So like that's why, which is actually pretty good from one side because you have at least had an advantage. Yeah. But they should just make it a time practice because in the qualifying heat, so many things happen. And they say, yeah, but the fans want this and the fans and they pay the ticket and this and that. I understand. But without clowns, there's no show at one time. So there were so many guys already out and so many guys are being injured right now. They should have either just do a time practice. And I believe a lot of riders want that. Like there are most riders, what I know, they wouldn't like to race only on Sunday. Some would like to ride on Saturday too, but they don't really like that qualifying race. Because everybody says like, what's the point of taking 40 extra starts? Uh, sorry, 20 extra starts on, on 20 races, extra risk, and it just doesn't make sense. So I believe the same thing. For me, that World Saturday should be should be gone. And I don't know exactly what happened. I hear something about a qualify with the qualifying heat, like it was a lot of mud and they didn't want to they didn't mm. want to uh, redo the first turn or something. And that's why there was a lot of uh, talk. But I wasn't there. So it's all from what I heard. And I don't know exactly what happened. And then um apparently somebody from Ustream or in front came up and said like to guys apparently like hey but yeah, yeah you guys who should run the show those all the spectators are paying to watch to see you ride and then something happened and then guys are in prado and see what else like hey we don't want to race it's too dangerous and, and stuff like that but once again i don't know exactly what has happened that's just the rumors what I, what i got told but um i think it's good like in 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 AMA Pro Motocross, at least you get paid. Like, if when I won two motos at uh, Ironman, uh, Davy Coombs came up to me and gave me five grand. Like, if if any local farmer would come out, race a GP, you have to freaking pay 1200 bucks or something, or 1000 mm. I don't know. You win both motos, you get a shake, they shake your hand, it's like, thank you. You make no money. So, you're so, like, only the top teams you get bonus from. But, like, Mm. In in AMA motocross, when you when you qualify yourself, you even get money. And I I think, you know, I don't want to put myself into shit, but like everybody's a bit scared to say something. Like I think in front does a lot of good things for the sport. Don't get me wrong, they do many many good things. They're super professional. But at that side, you know, you could see on the gates, like in Argentina, I I I even made a photo and put it on, on Instagram. Like I think the MX2 had like 15 yeah. riders on the gate. That's yeah. bad, man. Like I've never seen that in AMA Pro motocross. There's only 15 guys. So. Even on, on, on European races like Italy, there were like 25 riders on a 40 gate, like f gate, uh, 40 gate. So um, I think, yeah, you know, they they should at least pay a little bit to the riders. I mean, not even to the top riders, like the top guys, like mm. me, Favre, Geyser, we don't need that 1,000 euro. But the guy who finished 20, they need that 1,000 to survive, you know, and to get to the next race and things like that. So I believe that could could help and and to take out a bit of risk of not racing that saturday that would help but i'm just talking as an athlete i'm not talking um if it's going to be better for the sport yes or no and for tv rights and whatsoever i'm just talking pure as a athlete how i would consider it yeah now I, and i mean i understand the position that you're in like it's still like you're going to be limited to kind of what you can say so i completely understand um as far as the there's a couple things for me i love the sport like the mo the thing that i would like i first thing that comes to my head when you say i want to race tomax like all right one of you guys should make 100 grand like i've i'm so pro athlete i'm so pro rider getting what they deserve to get that's it's to me like you said there ain't no show without clowns unfortunately and at, at the level that you know, these guys are expected to, you know, to be from like 20th to 40th. There should be 40 gates at every, at every, um, MXGP. Like, how do you call it a world championship if there's 15 riders there? Like you, that's a, you can't, that's like a select few who can afford to get to this race championship. That's not a world championship. If you really want to call yourself the world championship, you need 40 fucking guys in two classes every single race for your world championship and and for guys to be paying a thousand euro per, i think it's around 900 to it's around a thousand euro i'm pretty sure to enter a race like mm. what the fuck tom brady doesn't play pay to play football he gets paid to play football like they understand the relationship like we're so fucking ass backwards when it comes to the way that the sport is run on some levels, there's some stuff that the sport, the sport does across the board. That's incredible, but there's also some areas that are pretty fucking dark and maybe they should get spoken a little bit, uh, more. And I mean, that's one of them to, to have those riders and uh, like to that few riders on the gate at, at any race. And it, that's 
been the talking point this year for me. Like, that's what I'm hearing is basically that, like, oh, did you Ring see the... Uh, yeah, we're good. We're good again. You just stop for sorry, brother. Um, yeah, so I mean, good? for me, when there's when there's four, you know, fifteen guys on a forty gate grid, there's just problems. Like, there's something that needs to, you know, if you're fucking whoever runs it, you go like, whoa, okay, we've got to figure something out because there's got to be more than fifteen dudes that want to crack at being world motocross champion. And then as far as the qualifying race thing goes, man, I am so on board with that. Like you, if, if it doesn't feel worth it to the majority of you guys, then like you probably shouldn't have to do it. I mean, you're right. Like the crashes that happen in MXGP is fucking pretty gnarly. Like you guys are just forced to send it. And, you know, there's got to be an element of rider safety that, that comes into play here a little bit more than what there probably is. And honestly qualifying races are fucking boring really like i just only ever watch the youtube highlights that are like four minutes long what i would way rather see now tell me if you think this is a good idea let's just do what formula one and moto gp does let's do q3 q2 and q1 and q1 is only so you, you start let's say you got 40 riders right so 40 riders do q3 so there's a board that you come in and you, so you can go out as Jeffrey Hurlings and you'll throw down a lap time that gets you in the top 20. Because for the first 10 minutes of the qualifying session, you've only got to be in the top 20, right? So you go out mm -hmm. and you throw one heater on the first lap, you're top 20. Then you can pull in and you can chill for that rest of that 10 minutes. You can fuck with your bike. You can do whatever. You can see what other times people are doing. You can see what other lines people are doing. All right, 20 minutes. So then 20 minutes is up or the first 10 minutes is up. Q3 drops away. So the bottom, the bottom uh, 20 riders would, who aren't in the top 20, they dip out. Then you move into Q2, which is the next 10 minutes. And then you've got to be in the top 10. So you as Jeffrey Hurlings, you go out and you throw down a lap time. And if you get in the top 10, then come back and chill again. Like you're only going to have to do that one lap, right? The next 10 minutes is up. So then the the uh, the bottom 10 drop away again. So now for 10 minutes, you're left with the top 10 dudes. And then it's basically just a send fest for those guys. And you can play cat and mouse. You can get behind each other. You're not going to have people getting in the, in the lines. And all that is broadcasted. And then that's what we get instead of a qualifying race. And I just think that would be so much more fun to watch. You'd see some dope shit. Like when you watch the Paris Supercross, uh, I like Bercy, and you see the Super Pole that they do at Bercy. That's my favorite shit of the whole weekend. Because, you know, like you watching like fucking Marvin and Caroli and Geyser and, and like Paul Lands had some crazy heaters there. Like that stuff to me is so cool. Like I get to see you guys do motos on the Sunday. So I don't, I don't know if that's a good idea for you. But I mean, to me as a fan, I would way rather watch that than watch just an, another qualifying race i'm gonna see two races that actually mean something on sunday two two hundred percent my man two hundred percent you know why and when you're riding alone for a heater you got everything in control because it's just you you know when you have a race mm. and you go into the first turn with so many guys you always need to have luck that if one guy hits you or whatever and rides over you you can be injured you can like when it's just a one lap thing you got you got it more in control so I believe what you said, it's, it's the right thing to do. I do believe like in MotoGP and Formula 1, you should have a little bit of advantage on the gate. Like Formula 1 is extreme in MotoGP, but mm. like often in Europe, like last weekend in Germany, when they put a gate a bit like sideways and then have the first one on the left, you do have an advantage. Because if not, like you have some occasions that, for example, like Arco di Trento track or whatever, um, we had three races that last year. Why was that qualifying? Because you could get a whole shot from any gate pick, you possibly mm. won it, you know? So you should have a little bit of advantage regarding gate pick. But like you said, they should just make a 30-minute uh, uh, time practice. It's just 10 minutes, Q3. If, but yeah, if there's only 15 riders, there's only a, there's already straight a Q1 for <laughs> probably not. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. a Q3, but like do a Q1, Q2, Q3 from either like 15 minutes each. Then you have a one-hour session. You have like 15 minutes, five-minute break, 15 minutes, five-minute break. So the, the, the guys who didn't qualify can get out, start again. Then you have a full one-hour program uh, for the fans to see. It's really like the fastest guy get the best gate pick. Um, 
you don't have yep. any issues with any bike problems or whatsoever because if you if you're leading a qualifying race last weekend in germany and you have like a flat tire or you have whatever may happen or a engine fa engine failure you're all the way outside of the gate you you even mm. if you make a great jump out of the gate you make a Jorge prado start or michael lassi you're still only 20th because you're so far out so uh for me like what you just mentioned is is, is a great uh, solution and I believe many riders will agree with you and with me um, but then the next thing is in front you know what I mean so um, mm. and I believe also many manufacturers will support that but yeah it's in front who needs to support this and that's not in my not in my hands and um, but what you just say yeah, I believe it's a great idea yeah well and I mean I think it's made better for TV You've got a 10-minute session, and then you can go to a five-minute commercial break, and a 10-minute session, and a five-minute commercial break, and a 10... Like, it's it's a great four-TV package. And then I'm going to... I'll tell you right now, as a fan, if I can watch you on a track with 10 other... Well, nine other of the best guys in the world, and just watch you guys, like, get to the, the cool games that would happen of like all of you guys before the start, like I could see you guys spacing out and just pacing each other and you'd just get this crazy train of 10 dudes that are just a roost length apart that are all trying to absolutely send it. I mean, that to me, that's the best kind of TV. And then I think the other cool thing is, you, you know, you've got 15 riders on the gate, right? Well, that's because it's so heavy at the top of the sport. Like the, the people at the top of the sport are the ones getting all of the TV time, which means they're getting all of the sponsors and all of the team support. So it makes sense why that happens, right? But so you're not going to ride much of Q3. So you're going to go out, you're going to probably leave first one off the gate. As soon as that checkered flag goes, uh, the green flag goes, you're probably going to do the time that's going to get you all the way through to Q1, right? So you're just going to be chilling. Yeah. You're pulling off the track. So then... This, the the top 10 dudes are probably going to do that. So then the camera, the guys that are going to be on the heaters are going to be like the David Walsh, the the um, yeah. the Jed Beatons, you know, like all those, all those boys that are like right there kind of in the thick of it. They're going to be the ones that are on TV for that entire 10 minutes because they're the guys that are trying to put in the, the heaters. Like I think that idea actually gives these guys way more opportunity to be on tv and then you go to your sponsors and you say like hey man like i've i've been in like on tv q2 every single race this year for like three laps here's my logo blah 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 blah. and then you know he's the guy on tv so teams are watching like i just think on so many levels it gives more of an opportunity to kind of like again they're not the sport's not terrible it's just there's some like big holes right now that could easily be plugged if someone just had the fucking balls to just do it and just go for one year and just be like, you know what, fuck it. We're dropping the Saturday races for one year. We're going to turn it into a Saturday quality session, blah, blah, do the idea that we're talking about. Don't do, do something different, whatever. Just have the fucking balls to just make a change, man, for one year and see how it goes. Like the Formula One's changing the rules every three years. So that the whole sport gets flipped. Why? Why can't we have some fucking balls like that? You know. And I just think that it's gonna. It. We've got to a point like you've got 15 riders on a gate, and then you've got a whole bunch of guys that just don't even want to race. Like you guys, ha there's a problem. So we should try and fix it. I am 200 percent with you, but maybe it's an option for you to speak with the boys up front, but in front, man. Maybe you should give them the idea because it's it's actually a great idea, and I think um, it will only get better because um like you said you'll see the race on saturday then you'll see the same thing happening on sunday but if you like when like like you said i went to paris when i seen james stewart on the heater dude yeah. it's gnarly man like yeah. but like i also like exactly what you said you don't want to have a time breaks from 40 minutes because at one point you don't have control because maybe one guy did a second lap of freaking heater you won't see him for the next 30 minutes but if you do like three sessions from 10 or 15 minutes with a five minute break of like almost an hour program which is good for TV, and mm. then especially that Q3 is super interesting when, when the top guys are going for hitters, and you see like, like amazing speed out there. 
and um yeah i believe that's that's a great thing and then having always a start getting in a position that you have a small advantage compared to the mm. rest i believe it's it, it's a great idea um so yeah i've i hope one day maybe the guys in the front will see this podcast or maybe hear it and uh if not you should you should tell them my man <laughs> yeah i don't have anyone's number mate um so <laughs> uh <laughs> so the one, uh, one thing i wanted to touch on a little bit as well is you've been like well you've been a lifer at ktm since you got off that rm80 that i watched you just destroy the world titles you've been a lifer at ktm um what's it been like to only have the one brand and only i mean i could see it it would make life so easy to just be on the one bike but then there's also some challenges that come with that so has it always been a goal to just stay on one brand have you ever come close to signing with a different team or is you just always been like red bull ktm this is where i'm at now nah, in the past i was i was definitely in talk with different teams um recently not uh not yet and but next year's my contract year and definitely you know i know it's going to be probably my last two or three year deal um because like next year i'm 28 and then i'll sign for, for my age 29 30 31 so that will be my that will be my last contract and you know it's a make or break you know even if i want to stay with ktm that's going to be my last contract and if i want to change next year after next year is the year to do so right now i'm happy with ktm and um they've given me everything i always uh requested for and and uh what was what was possible so i was i'm very happy to have worked with them for 13 years and they uh yeah they were always there for me so but i would not tell you today like hey i'll, I'll never change you know I'm, I'm i'm not married to kdm i'm very happy with them we have a good re a professional working relationship uh they do what i expect from them i do what they expect from me and yeah next year 31st of december my contract is up and then i'm basically you know i have options to 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 go somewhere else but for now um it's still far away but uh, yeah next year around this time it will be a heating moment yeah because i can see um I, I mean dude the thing that would make it kind of again to talk about tomac is like you look over the fence and you go ah fuck he did it <laughs> you know <laughs> he was so dialed at, at cowie and looked i mean he, he won so many races he won so many championships and then he kind of saw something and went all right that's what i want to get i think that there was probably uh, an element of wanting to go a certain direction with the bike, wanting to have a little bit more freedom that uh, he didn't get. So, I mean, I don't think you have that issue uh, at KTM, but I mean, it's, it's kind of, I feel like the Eli change and then the Anderson change has probably got everybody that's been on a manufacturer for a really long time being like, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, it could be a, a big motivation. You, I, I saw the the Jason podcast, and he said like, I was always with the same people, and then I got a fresh, like a fresh group of people, and it was it was really motivating me. So, yeah, you know, I've been with the same people for almost thirteen years, and riders came, riders gone, mechanics came, mm. mechanics gone, other people where I work with came and gone, but I, I always stayed there, you know. So, um, yeah, like after I seen with Eli, like that, he also said I needed a new motivation with with being on Kawi since. 2017 or 2016 i don't know exactly to 16, 2021 yeah so he's been like five years or something uh um five or six years so he needed a change and yeah for me it's it's too early to say right now what i'm really looking forward to in one and a half year from now but yeah you know to also for the for the industry it would never be bad you know for a rider to change for example, for me, like mm. Kaiser has been Honda, I've been KTM, Caroli been KTM, Prado been KTM, basically all their careers or a lot of time of their careers. And it's always nice because like when I remember when I went to watch Anaheim, I was like really curious to see how Tomek was going to yeah, be yeah. on the Yamaha and how Anderson was going to be on the Kawi because, okay, you've seen some videos, but then when you get a big change, especially when Kenny went from Suzuki to Honda, everybody wanted to mm. see how that would turn out. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it could be something for the industry which is um yeah it, it's maybe a good thing sometimes riders change their manufacturer you know it's not like in football you have 200 clubs you can play for it's basically there's only five brands or something what you i mean gas gas husqvarna ktm is kind of one group and then you have that mm. yama kawi and honda and then suzuki is basically pulled out i heard about triumph maybe coming to us um mm. in europe you have another team called beta but it's not the best of bikes yet so 
the problem is you just don't have a major group of players where you can work mm. with you know there's just a, a few manufacturers and that's it yeah yeah and i think too i mean you just don't seem like the kind of guy that needs that extra motivation, you know? So you hear what Tomac said about it's a new challenge, it's a new motivation, or same with, with Ando. And I just don't think motivation's like ever been your uh, a struggle for you and it probably won't ever be a struggle for you. I just feel like you've got other shit going on to that motivates you to win. Nah, true, but same, you know? Um, I've been always working with the same group of people to maybe have a small change at one time. You know, it can be positive, it can be negative. Right now, I'm super happy with KTM. They treated me very well always throughout my career. So I always had good deals. I had a great bike. I, I believe KTM is still a great bike right now. So it's, 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 I don't need that as a motivation. Just maybe at that time, yeah. when the time comes near, maybe next year I would, I would take it like, okay, hey, new group of people, new bike, new motivation in that way. But right now, I'm happy where I am. And um, yeah, from my main priority now to get back healthy. And to win next year, next year I'm on KDM 100% because it's my last year. Of, yeah, it's my contract still with KDM, and yeah, obviously at one point next year we need to consider and and negotiate where we're gonna go in uh, 23 and beyond. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Is it is it a a distracting thing to deal with the whole contract talk in the industry? Um, so Jack Miller's a, one of my best mates, and he's just gone through the the whole switch to ktm he actually wasn't even allowed to post about it or nothing like everyone else has posted about it except him because of the whole contract you know how it works but i mean that's just been contract talk after contract talk after contract talk and then ricardo same deal i don't know if you follow but he had a, a bad run at monaco and the, the season hasn't been what he would want and then you get to this race at Monaco. And as soon as one guy says contract, 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 the entire internet blew up with just people saying that McLaren's kicking him out, blah, blah, blah. How much as a rider does it fucking piss you off to just talk about contracts in the middle of the season? Depending on your position, when you're in finishing seven every single weekend, you're just really begging for a ride. When you're winning... You're in the yeah. fucking hot seat, yeah. my man. Every team wants you. You know, you can put down the price, what you're requesting. Okay, it needs to be reasonable and need to be acceptable. You cannot go in motocross and hey, I want 10 million. Or like in Formula 1 or MotoGP as a top guy. But you, you have prices, more or less. They change, they go up, they go down. But um, when you're winning, you're in the hot seat. When you're not winning and you're fighting for 10th place, yeah, you don't want to be in that position because then first the, the, the big stars, they need to put their hand on paper somewhere and then you go more down to the list but throughout the years i've always been luckily the higher fish of the <laughs> of the list yeah. so um next year is going to be an important year because a lot of contracts are going to be finished mine I, I believe prado in europe i believe favor um sewer uh so a lot of contracts are going to be up um i believe geyser is going to renew with honda hsc i don't know exactly i just hear some rumors for 23 24 i don't know if that's signed or it's not signed but i don't really know where else you i heard should, him you and i heard him and mitch are both signed again oh uh, yeah I, but i believe you know hsc is nothing with a gauss in europe you know they need geyser you know wait, you don't have me you don't have guy uh prado you don't have renault you don't have Fever, ever yeah. then you need geyser so um because yeah. all the other guys are still stuck they if if hsc doesn't sign tim what are they gonna do without him i mean mitchell's not gonna win a championship for them so there's only guys so who's able to win and um yeah he's he's been in the hot seat so um yeah that's about it i think it's uh i think that you know it, there's on the one side it's like yeah you can get that fresh change and you can it would be pretty cool to see you ride a different color but then i think as well ktm is probably one of the coolest companies in the world to be with if you're a motocross rider ktm probably is the coolest company and i think that the way that they they race every series in every single... You know, I think that the only series that they haven't won is a MotoGP championship, which basically, you know, I think that's probably where most of KTM's money is going at the moment uh, is to try and win that thing. But you're just with this crazy group of people like Pitt and that whole crew 
just want to win everything so bad. And I mean, that's pretty in line with, with your values. And then, you know, you think about after racing to just be able to be involved in that company and so tight with Red Bull. And it just seems like, I don't know, it just seems like a pretty dope place to retire and stay cool with. Like, you know, Carmichael retired on a Suzuki and then you just, it just goes away. And then you kind of, there's no, there's nothing for Carmichael to really do in motocross at Suzuki. I think he's going to be with Triumph now. Um, but, you know, like to stay involved and to stay with a brand. Like if you talk about retiring at a brand, like KTM's probably the one to retire at. Yeah, you know, there's, there, the, they also need brand ambassadors at Gawi, at, Gawi, at Yama, at, at other manufacturers as well. But KTM has been very good, you know. Um, KTM have a lot of brand ambassadors. You have Joel Smets in Europe. You have now Caroli. Mm. Um, probably they have they have a few more but um yeah like you said a lot of the budget goes into motor gp right now and obviously this year the the results of kdm in motocross um unfortunately weren't the greatest you know they haven't won a supercross championship lights not uh 450 they're probably not going to win a 450 outdoor championship they're not going to win a 450 mxgp championship uh most likely with guys are being leading uh, they have highly chances on MX2, but regarding to to a few years back, you know they were they were dominating everything, but obviously they were at bad luck with me being injured and yeah, just things just didn't click this year. Um, you have those years you see with Mitch Payton and in, in the, 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 yeah. the beginning of the de last decade in 2010, everybody wanted to be on a Mitch Payton Kawasaki every weekend one two three four five with a monster pro circuit guys. So. Um, you can it's normal you cannot always win yeah and i believe ktm still yeah. is may, uh, most arguably maybe still the number one team but just that bad luck you know like with me being injured with cooper webb having some issues at the beginning of the year you know he, he wasn't his his self let's say um then eli going to yama and being super super fast and jason being super fast you know you can always win but globally i think yeah ktm is just a great team and 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 even if i would the finish with KTM, I w then I can look back on a great career and and, and working with it w only one great brand. Um, so anywhere any decision I'll make, I will support it. And I believe also if you would go to a brand like Kawi or Yama, uh, they will also maybe look after you after your career. But definitely being finishing with KTM after such a long time of sixteen years is different mm. than finishing with like for example three years for Yama or Kawi or, or anything like that. So hundred um, percent. It's different, you know, so, uh, but right now I'm super happy with KDM and I think, yeah, this is something really early to talk about right now, but in a year from now, yeah, once again, it's going to be a hot topic for, for myself personally to decide what I'm going to do as, as my final contract. Yeah. So, uh, to be like, uh, let's go like done with racing now. And you posted on your Instagram a while ago and it was like the most fucking gangster thing in the world where you're like just signed off my nine millionth house and uh fucking <laughs> i'm the man <laughs> basically it was no. the most like out of control flex of all time so you're pretty deep in the real estate game huh yeah and actually it's doing good man <laughs> it's good, good, good. <laughs> less worrying the racing people just paying the rent nothing i need to do for that so um no it's good because I, I really love it like i've been like when I had my, my, my impact on my right foot, it was almost like a Kenny Roxon career ending ending move uh, or injury. So at that point I was like, okay, what I'm gonna do, you know, I always had really good contracts. I won a lot. Um, I've been doing this 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 game since 12 years. And uh, at that time, you know, I decided to go into real estate, which was still a good time. Cause now in Holland, especially where I lived, the, 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 it's overheated with the war. I don't know if you know about the war we have in here and, yeah, and, and yeah. With Russia and Ukraine. And then there's all coronavirus and all the material getting super expensive. So I just got everything sorted just before then. So the house price went really m a lot up. And um, yeah, it's something for after my career because it's just, it's a, it's a low risk, you know. I know a lot of your Aussie friends are a lot into crypto and uh, shit like that, but yeah. that's, that's like a gambling kind of thing with real estate. It's a car yeah. market. People just pay their rent every single month. You know your income. And that just brought me a lot of peace. And um, yeah, I just like real estate. So uh, also went after my career. I, I'm not the type of guy who, who would who would still love to travel to all the races and just be a brand ambassador. For me, when I retire racing, I'm done, man. I, I, I don't... Maybe I ride now and then for fun with some friends, but I don't want to go to every single GP or coach or rider whatsoever. So then 
I more or less I'm also a little bit business related. I love to do mm. to work with money and and, 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 and and stuff like this. So that's maybe something what I'm gonna do after my career to do into something with real estate. For now, I don't know exactly what I wanna do because I still plan on racing for a few more years. But that's one of the options I could maybe do after my after my career. Yeah, because I mean, I, I guess that's interesting that that you don't see yourself going to the races and and riding as much. Like, do, is riding still like how much of you still just thinks riding is fun, and how much of it is tied to the the results and the winning and the like competitiveness and doing the best that you can? Uh, because there is definitely like beat like Ben Townley. I just went and raced with Ben Townley two weekends ago. We had the most fucking fun I think I've ever had. Well, on a bike, I had the least amount of fun that I've ever had because I sucked. Uh, but in terms of at a race weekend, just hanging with my friends, that was probably one of the funnest weekends of my entire life. And like BT, dude, there was one moto where, because he fucking raced the pros. I think he got like fifth or something. But there was one moto that he come in and he's like, just jumps on the ground. He's like, bro, you got to pop my knee back in. You got to pop my knee back in. So I'm like grabbing on his fucking Alpine star, pulled his knee back in the socket. And he's like, dude, how good is the track right now? And he's just frothing, bro. Just fully losing it. Like moto kid loves it more than ever. So it's like, do you see yourself being that guy that still loves to ride? Or is riding just like literally a means to an end? <laughs> this guy had some serious injury bt man fuck he had a shit load of injuries <laughs> gnarly huh? i'll make you a question yeah <laughs> he's gnarly dude bro um nah like right now for me uh, i do it because i love doing it i love riding but at the same time i love doing it because i want good results like like i could have came back yeah. and and not have the surgery and and still be a bit of pain and, and ride around and maybe win some races here and there but i want to be completely healthy and come back for winning because I, I for me it's fun when i'm able to win when I finish fifth, it's not fun. There's no fun of finishing fifth and not being on the podium. You want to win. So um, for me, it's just a mix. It, it's just fun when I'm able to ride for at least podiums or at least for for trying to win. Not If I'm just there to burning fuel and finishing seventh, I'm out, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm For sure, you can finish seventh sometimes, but at, at mainly, you know, I, I want to be just competitive for, for a championship. And the day I'm not competitive anymore, I don't feel like it's going to be fun anymore by then. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that makes sense, and uh, that's respectable too, you know. So, what uh, real estate wise, like, how hands on are you? Are you watching markets? Are you doing that whole deal, or are you like you've got some people that you work with, or how interested in it are you? I'm really interested in it, like, um, but like now it's not a great time because of the war. Obviously, to invest yeah, yeah. a bit more because like now everything got super super expensive. But um, I'm really into it. I like it. Um, just it's, it's pretty boring, you know. Like I've got my people doing it for me. But yeah, they just buy, they're, they're, just, they're just building a house. And yeah, they're building a house. And yeah, there's nothing really spectacular onto it. And it's just pure as investment. Um, but then you come back to the business side. And then you're something, okay, hey, what if I'm going to buy them? And I'm going to sell them at one point, you know. And I'll make the profit. So that's things, you know, for after my career. Um, but for now, the first few years, that's not nothing to to really worry about but things like that could be interesting as a uh in a way of of really trying to make from money more money um mm. but right now i'm just focused on my sport and i don't like yeah we've been speaking a little bit about money but i don't really give a shit about money to be honest uh it's it's, it's mm. important as, as your career is, is, is short but um for me the fun in racing is still the racing and the riding and definitely mm. that's that's not so fun times when you just shatter your foot and your foot is like all the way around on your on your on your leg you're like this is not so much fun but when when, when you healed up and everything goes well then you yeah you kind of enjoy enjoy it and for me the most enjoyable is when you're on top side of the podium and you're trying to you know you you're beating the top guys that makes me just smile then you go to bed on a sunday night you're like yeah boy we've done it you know so um yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah that's so sick dude um yeah because i think like i think about uh mick Dorn a lot i mean he was won five moto g well five 500 gp titles or whatever it was called back then won them in a row and then he kind of like made a bit of money through his career and he ended up getting like he kind of worked his way into getting this private jet and then that turned into now he owns like this jet craft business and he's just super into business and it's almost like the investing and the business thing become his second sport 
and all of the things that he, the same things that he enjoyed about racing at the highest level and beating the best guys, he now enjoys that same thing in business. And I, I could kind of see you being similar in that way. Yeah, hundred percent. Because you're like now you're searching. Okay, if the ground is that price, there we're gonna find try to find ground where it's cheaper. And then if you trying to, it's it's like kind of a sport. And then you go try to, to the builders who's building the houses. Okay, you try to ask five kind of companies like, hey, you for, for what price can you do it? What price can you do it? So it's, it actually is a sport, you know, like to yeah. get it as as high quality as you can for the cheapest price as you can. So eventually, it's 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 kind of a sport, but it's just different it's a low it's just a financial risk there's no yeah i would say uh Physical. human body yeah. <laughs> risk involved yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true yeah yeah and and i think that um yeah you are right like and i think it is cool for you to say that you like the winning more than the money like and again it's the goal if the goal is to just be a millionaire you could spend your entire life thinking about how to be a millionaire but if you like you go all right the goal is to win or to be the best dirt bike rider on the planet well if you're the best dirt bike rider on the planet you're just gonna be a millionaire it's the same as if you're the best uh like race car driver in the world it's just there's certain thing if you're the best singer in the world if you're the best youtuber in the world whatever you are if you're the best in the world at it then money is going to be a byproduct and to be the best in the world at something you can't be motivated by the money because it's just not enough i don't think that money is fulfilling enough of a thing to put you yourself through what you've put yourself through in your life like you've paid i mean even if you read off the injury list like if you said to someone like hey i'll transfer 10 million dollars into your account right now but you've got to break your neck you've got to shadow your heel you've got to break your other foot you've got to do this you've got to do four million kilometers on a road bike you've got to burn five hundred thousand liters of if you listed all the shit that you did in your career and then just said to that person but i'll transfer 12 million dollars into your bank account <laughs> it's not that most people wouldn't nobody would have fucking they done couldn't it, do it <laughs> <laughs> bro That's no true. one's signing up for that shit that go like fuck i'll just try to do crypto <laughs> yeah i'll just put something in. nah true you know it's for me money never been a motivation like i i that's what i said in the beginning of our talk like if money is your motivation you will not make it like you will make mm. it if you're passionate about your sport and if you're passionate about winning in your discipline and that's what I've always been like i've been and then the money will come like like yeah that's what I said before about Christian Ronaldo. He will not go to that football match to try to get money. He wants to go to the win. And I'm in there in the same thing. And eventually, every sport has their numbers. Like, motocross is here. MotoGP is there. Formula 1 is there. Football is maybe even higher. But end of the day, if you want to become rich, it's difficult. You know, for sure, you need to have that motivation. But in a sport-wise, you want to go there to win. You, if, if you go there, because, hey, if I win, I'll get a 100,000 euro bonus or 50,000 or whatever it may be. You're not gonna win. You wanna you wanna go there to say, hey, I'm gonna win, and I wanna win, and I wanna beat this freaking Eli Tomac yeah. or Tim Geiser or wherever it may be, you know. And that's that's how I believe you're gonna win. But everybody's different, and for some guys, money is a motivation. For some guys, don't, and it's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, mate, I reckon I don't know what the time is, but I reckon we've probably done three hours. So I um I we're appreciate done. it. <laughs> I've I have enjoyed this podcast so much. You're a fucking G. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, mate, you're welcome on here anytime that you want. Uh, and my goal leaving here is to have a group text with me, you and Eli. And we're going to set up a race for $100,000. <laughs> you're going to get And I'm budget. dead get serious. Get I am dead serious. And gotta make Eli motivated and we're going to freaking send it. Nah. All right, mate. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And... Um, yeah, I don't know what time it is in Australia, but I see something like nine in the evening probably on your uh, yeah, on your yeah. watch. So uh, yeah, have a have a good night, mate, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, man, and thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And again, shout out to Rick. This wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for him. Uh, make sure you check out the Behind the Bullet series on YouTube. Uh, I'd say it'll probably be coming the next time that that you race. So shout out to Rick. He's the fucking man. He makes all the, the gypsy tales in Europe happen. Um, and yeah, bro, thank you so much. I've enjoyed it so much. And I know so many people are going to love listening to you. So, All right. I'm very curious to see it. When does it come out? Probably. Like when are you going to put it up to YouTube or whatever? Or Spotify? I reckon maybe like a, 
next week maybe i think by the time we get all right. it all edited and, and and done yeah, yeah oh yeah we're not fucking right. around people want this bro all right bro i'm gonna be excited to see it all right mate have a good night see ya you you too legend appreciate it all right mate see ya if you enjoyed this content please like and subscribe and to listen to the full three-hour podcast search gypsy tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below gypsy gang